Okay, can I welcome everyone to the 29th meeting of the Local Government and Communities Committee in 2018 and remind everyone present to turn off their mobile phones. As meeting papers are provided in digit format, tablets may be used by members during the meeting. The committee is invited to consider and agree whether to take agenda items four and five on the budget and on the fuel poverty bill in private. Agenda item one, are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Agenda item two, the stage five of stage two of the planning bill, and I welcome the Minister for Local Government and Housing, Kevin Stewart, and his accompanying officials to today's meeting. Some MSPs who are not committee members but have lodged amendments to the bill will again be in attendance today and are very welcome. I therefore call amendments 257 in the name of the Minister, grouped with amendments 145, 146 and 147. Good morning, convener. Um, this group of uh, amendments relates to a planning authority's ability to refuse to even deal with an application. Uh, the current provisions are in section 39 of the 1997 Act. Uh, this power applies where, within the previous two years, uh, a similar application was refused by Scottish ministers as a result of a call-in or appeal, or the planning authority refused it on local review, or where, in the absence of such an a, a appeal or review decisions, the planning authority has refused two previous similar applications. A similar application in this context is one where the land and the proposal are the same or substantially the same. The other criterion that applies is that there, there has been no significant change in the development plan so far as it is relevant to the case or in any other material considerations. This ensures that the decision is based on planning considerations and is not arbitrary. Um, I appreciate there can be concerns within communities uh, where the same or similar proposals for a site keep being submitted as applications despite previous refusal of permission. However, a second application can, in some circumstances, serve a useful purpose in proposing changes to a development that can address the original grounds for refusal. Uh, a proposal cannot be varied on appeal, so this may be the best way of making an application better. Uh, we also need to bear in mind that the planning system can, in the public interest, prevent a person developing their land. As this affects their human rights, we need to be careful how we restrict their access to the decision-making process. There is no planning appeal procedure where a planning authority declines to determine an application. Uh, taking those into account, uh, Amendment 257 in my name seeks to extend the period within which the power to decline to determine can apply from the current two years to five years. Uh, this is a significant extension, uh, more than double the time. Uh, Claudia Beamish's uh, Amendment uh, 145 uh, would extend the period from two years to ten years. Uh, these amendments do not change the position that authorities cannot decline to determine an application where there has been a significant change in the development plan or in other material considerations. However, that means the original grounds for refusal have to be revisited in the light of the current position and indeed may no longer apply. Uh, the planning authority will have to reach a considered and reasonable judgment on whether there have been any significant changes in circumstances. That does not mean reaching a view that the authority would make the same decision again. That would require processing of the application and considering the position anew. Uh, the longer the time since the original decision, the more likely that some material consideration will have changed uh, and the more difficult it will be for the planning authority to be certain whether there has been a change or not. If they cannot be certain, uh, they will have to process the application. It is not reasonable to suppose that circumstances will not change substantially over a period of 10 years, and therefore it is unlikely that any cases could be declined at that timescale. And I believe that a five-year period represents a more reasonable extension uh, to uh, the times involved. Amendment 145 
uh, would also remove the right to make one similar application after a refusal before the ability to decline to determine applies. As I've said, I believe a second application can be helpful in addressing the concerns that people have raised, so I do not support that provision. Amendment 146 would re require Scottish ministers to publish guidance on interpreting the definition of a similar application and on what constitutes a significant change as regards the development plan and other material considerations. As I said in relation to a previous amendment, guidance cannot change the meaning of legislation. Interpretation is a matter for the courts. In any case, guidance could not usefully address all the possible issues that might arise in every type of case. Amendment 147 would introduce a specific power allowing ministers to introduce regulations to charge a higher fee for similar applications. Currently, fee regulations allow a zero fee where an applicant submits a largely similar application within 12 months of a decision on the previous application. Uh, we have already indicated our intention uh, to reconsider this free go uh, in, the free, in the fees review um, following the bill. However, given that planning fees are in principle about cost recovery, there is no obvious basis for charging a higher than standard fee for repeat applications, which can often serve a useful purpose. Uh, we do uh, propose imposing a surcharge over and above the fee payable for a retrospective planning application. In such cases, however, there is a breach of planning control and the surcharge is an, in effect a penalty rather than relating to the cost of processing the application. I would therefore ask that Claudia Beamish not move her amendments in this group and I move amendment 257, convener. Thank you very much. Uh, Claudia Beamish to speak to amendment 145 and other amendments in the group. Thank you, convener, and good morning to you and the committee and to the minister. Amendment uh, 145 aims to increase the time period in which local authorities potentially have to deal with uh, multiple similar applications for the same development from two to 10 years. And it also aims uh, to ensure that the local authority has the discretion to decline to determine the second application if it is deemed to be similar within a 10 year period. As the minister has already highlighted, section 39 of the act means that even if planning authorities have refused a uh, planning application, they are usually obliged to deal with a second application for the same development, whether submitted a few months or a few years later. Planning authorities are unable to decline to determine the second application unless ministers have refused permission for the development within the last two years. The current more than one uh, stipulation allows developers an opportunity to submit a second application within 12 months of their original application being refused, and the local authority are obliged to deal with that second application. It is only when a third application is submitted that local authorities can decline to determine it. This inability to decline the second application is often referred to, in community groups anyway, as a free go for the developer. This amendment will give the planning authority the power to decline to determine the second application if they consider it appropriate to do so. And I do note the Minister's comments on this, but I still um, wish to pursue this aspect of it um, from the... Um, from the perspective of more balance with communities. The need for this is even more pertinent, in my view, when you consider that at present, depending on the timescales for the two previous applications, the planning authority may be able to decline to determine the third resubmitted application, but if, but if the third application is submitted more than two years after the refusal of the original application, the planning authority have to deal with it, and the process starts again. In my view, this is a war of attrition in some cases um, for communities. If the timescales in section 39 of the Act were to stay at two years, this three-year application cycle can potentially com uh, occur every couple of years. My amendment would extend it from two to ten. I note the Minister has recognised the burden these current of these current timescales on communities and has submitted... Uh, uh, 257, which suggests an increase from two to five years. However, I do not consider this to be long enough. And I also note the Minister's HR comments. Um, there are, in my view, also human rights um, 
aspects which need to be considered for communities as well as for developers. I also note that, in my, if my understanding is correct, that 257 does not address the developer's opportunity to have a free go within uh, 12 months of submitting a similar application. Increasing the restriction of similar applications from 2 to 10 and giving the local authority more scope to decline to determine will prevent communities and local authorities being consistently worn down by repeat applications. Within my own area, I have an example of a developer who was first refused planning permission in 2009. Since then, two further applications have been submitted and an appeal for the third application has recently been made. This is nearly 10 years of relentless pursuit of the same site. And as a community activist, I also have experience of this from, uh, from the community side as I was involved in fighting inappropriate open cast for seven years. The, the current process prevents communities from moving on, in my view, from the threat of previously rejected unsuitable proposals. This uncertainty can affect other investment in an area and consideration also has to be given to the money spent by planning departments reviewing subsequent apps, applications. Over the years, I have raised this a number of times with the Scottish Government and in 2015 I met with Alex Neil in an attempt to address this frequency. Sadly, there was no appetite to change it at that stage and I hope the planning bill will now, now allow for that change and I recognise the Minister has, has moved on this issue since we had discussions before um, the summer recess. The recommendations of the Stage 1 report on the planning bill finally were that it was content with the proposals to change the planning, the local development plans to a 10-year cycle. The aim of this is to create a greater connection between communities and local improvement plans as we know, and to provide a more coherent vision for communities. The time period for repeat applications reflecting the local development plan cycle proposed, along with giving local authorities the power to decline as a second similar application, would, in my view, help to secure this long-term vision for Scotland. In terms of 146, in an attempt to restrict the occurrence of repeat applications along with 145 to extend the time scale, I propose the Scottish Government consider producing guidance on what constitutes significant change in a planning application. There is currently no statutory definition of what constitutes significant change, as the Minister has highlighted in his remarks about his own amendment. It is at the discretion of the planning authority to establish if an application is similar. And I do note the uh, Minister's comments about the courts as well. However, in my view, guidance would create consistency in the decision-making of the planning authority and give them confidence in that decision. It would also inform developers of wh what level of change is expected before an application will be reconsidered. And finally, on 147, to take a quick sip of water. Thank you, convener. As part of a package of amendments to address serial applications with 145 and 146, we must, in my view, look at fees and the cost of resubmitting a similar application. If a developer is putting forward an application within the 10-year period proposed in my amendment and it is found to be similar, the planning authority should have discretion to apply <coughs> an appropriately significant fee. If this amendment is successful at stage two, it may be better considered in the future as a fine, um, in, in parenthesis, as the aim of the amendment is to remove the incentive to lodge a similar application when it has already been declined or is still under review. Thank you. Just thank you very much. <laughs> Monica, do you want to say? Um, thank you, convener. Um, I think there's obviously been good progress made um, in terms of Claudia's proposals and, and the minister has, has moved somewhat from perhaps what his predecessor's position was. So um, I welcome the local example that Claudia has given. Um, I don't know if all the members in the committee have received this email, but yesterday, Kill Macomb Residents Association got in touch. I don't know the local circumstance, but they've talked about a situation where uh, a volume house builder has tried three times to get planning permission on a Greenbelt site. It's been refused twice by the planning authority and an appeal has been dismissed by a reporter. Um, but they talk about that culture of repeat applications until developers get what they want. So I will be supporting um, the Minister's amendment and Claudia Beamish's amendment because I think these um, amendments will not only improve planning practice, but help to change that culture because all of us 
I believe, want to strengthen the plan-led system and um, minimising um, repeat applications um, would be some way towards that. Okay, thank you. Uh, Annabel? Yes, um, this uh, amendment on the part of, of the Minister uh, deals with, of course, the important issue of serial applications, and I'm pleased to note that the Minister has uh, responded to concerns that I certainly have raised over the last uh, while, and I'm sure other members have as well, so I think it's a very positive development. Of course, I think what is not actually well known at the moment is that local authorities, planning authorities, do have discretion. Uh, and I don't think that's well known, and it's not well known amongst communities, and, and it doesn't even seem to be well known amongst some councillors that actually this is a, 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 a power that local authorities currently have. But I'm very pleased indeed to see that the period in question will be, uh, if the amendment is accepted, extended to five years. I think uh, with respect to uh, Claudia Beamish's amendment on that point, I think a five-year period strikes the right balance. I think that reflects uh, the... the um, the issues involved, including, uh, importantly, I think, as the Minister said, that there is no planning appeal procedure where the planning authority does exercise discretion to, de to decline to determine the application in light of this provision. So I think the five-year period strikes are an important balance, and I would be very happy to support this. I think this is a very welcome amendment that uh, communities across Scotland will uh, uh, be supportive of. Thank you. Thank you. Minister. Um, uh, thank you very much, Convener. I'm um, um, happy that Ms Ewing has highlighted the discretion that already exists. I have to say that at points it's frustrating for me as Minister um, to have to write to, to people, many of whom sh who should be in the know, uh, including local authority elected members, about um, these discretionary powers um, that are there. Um, I don't want to sound like a broken record um, convener, but I, I, I must reiterate um, the point around about guidance um, and all that we are doing here. Um, guidance cannot change the meaning of legislation. Um, it just cannot. Um, and as I said earlier, interpretation is a matter for uh, the courts. Um, and as I've uh, said again and again here, uh, guidance uh, cannot usefully address all of the issues uh, that might arise in every type of case. Um, uh, very briefly, Convener. Uh, uh, thank, thank you. Um, while the Minister says that it can't change the meaning, surely guidance can reflect what the, the Bill um, says in terms of developing um, clarity. And I believe that my Amendment 146 would do this and help um, uh, those who make these decisions to make them in, in a consistent way. Uh, convener, um, as I've already said, guidance cannot change the meaning of primary legislation. That is a matter for the courts. And beyond that, the last point that I made is that you cannot set out in guidance every sim single aspect um, that may or may not occur. And I, I think this um, theme will arise again uh, later on today as it has uh, in the past. Guidance is not the way to deal with this at all. Um, and in terms of timescales, um, as um, I have uh, put forward in my amendment, uh, what we see is a, a, an increase in the timescale. In terms of Ms Beamish's amendment, uh, what we will see, um, without a doubt, is that there will be uh, material consideration changes and maybe even development plan changes within the 10-year timescale that she envis envisages. Um, and I think it would be unreasonable um, not to suppose that circumstances uh, will change within that lengthy period. And I think that that's why the five-year period is the logical one uh, to deal with here. So there, uh, very briefly. I'll be very brief. Are those not the same arguments that were levied against your proposals, Minister, to move from a five-year to a ten-year um, local development plan cycle? And we've managed to overcome those concerns? I think there are real differences in terms of what we're seeing here and what uh, has been proposed in terms of the local development plan cycle. Um, the entire scenario um, of moving from five years to ten years in the local development plan cycle uh, was to concentrate uh, on delivering rather than constantly planning. 
Um, what we will see um, with Ms Beamish's amendment here is the very real changes that will happen over that period of time. Um, and I think um, that the five-year scenario is the logical one. And therefore, convener, I would ask folk to support Amendment 257 in my name and to reject the other amendments in my group. Thank you very in, much. In the therefore, group. the question is that Amendment 257 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. yes. 257 is agreed to. I call Amendment 307 in name of Daniel Johnson. Already debated with Amendment 207, and I believe, Monica, you're going to move this on behalf of Daniel Johnson? Yes. So, will you move. officially move it? Move Thank it. you. Uh, the question is that Amendment 307 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. yes. I call Amendment 306 in the name of Lewis MacDonald. Already debated with Amendment 2. Lewis MacDonald to move or not move? Moved. Thank you. Yes, you have. Uh, okay, thank you. The question is that Amendment 306 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Uh, those in favour of Amendment 306? Okay, those opposed? The amendment is passed 4 3. Call Amendment 318 in the name of Mark Ruskell, grouped with amendments as shown in the groupings. Mark Ruskell to move Amendment 318 and speak to all amendments in the group. Oh. Thank you, Convener. Yes, I would like to move and speak to 318. Um, the inspiration for this amendment came from the Scottish Parliament's first ever inquiry into air quality that took place last year in the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee. And there was a strong conclusion that consideration of air quality issues were not adequately embedded into the planning system and that change was needed. And the Minister spoke last week about creating uh, great places. Well, great places are also healthy places. And the reality is that we have 2,000 people dying every year in part due to air pollution. We have, of course, statutory limits on the levels of pollutants in our air. And where levels are persistently breached, that leads to the designation of an air quality management area. There are 32 of these around Scotland, and the designation leads to the production of action plans led by councils in an attempt to drive pollutant levels back under legal limits. However, there is no explicit link to the planning system. Most AQMAs are designated on the basis of transport emissions, but there is evidence that major developments are being approved without adequate mitigation measures being put in place, effectively locking in illegal levels of pollution. And I'd point to the example of a major housing allocation in Schoon, where it's demonstrated that the building of 700 houses would have a significant impact on two AQMAs in Perth. This led to the Director of Public Health for Tayside NHS lodging a formal objection to the, to the development. Later on, it was finally agreed in discussions around phasing that only part of the development could be constructed ahead of a relief road being built to take traffic away from the two AQMAs. But this was very much an afterthought in the planning process, and only after a vociferous campaign by local communities was it considered at all. So my amendment seeks to rectify the situation by elevating the consideration of air quality issues in planning. It would apply to decisions taken for major developments in AQMAs and those areas which are on the cusp of being designated due to persistently high pollution levels. Now, I had originally lodged an amendment uh, back in the summer that would have applied to all applications, both major and minor. But I've now withdrawn that amendment and re-lodged it as 318 so that the provision only applies to major developments. Any increases in air pollution that may occur from a minor development would be relatively insignificant, whereas major developments go through an environmental assessment screening process, and if appropriate, a full assessment is produced alongside traffic impact assessments. This should provide a robust basis for planning authorities to consider air quality issues. So this amendment isn't about stopping development per se, it is about ensuring that if a planning authority wishes to approve a major development in an AQMA, then mitigation must be fully considered and acted on. And I would conclude, convener, by asking what the point is of having legally binding targets if they have little weight when it comes to planning decisions uh, just to be considered as part of the balance of issues, as the minister put it last week. It is this failure to embed air quality into plans which has led to successful legal actions against both the UK and Scottish governments in recent years. And the committee has the opportunity today to protect human health and to create great places by approving this amendment. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Jeremy Balfour to speak to Amendment 80 and other amendments in the group. Thank you, 
Uh, thank you, Convener, and, and good morning. Um, Amendment 80 aims to ensure that when applications are made to the Planning Authority for planning permission regarding development of housing suitable for older people and disabled people, the Planning Authority must proceed on the assumption that such an application will normally be granted permission. Given that within a generation, a third of all Scots will be aged over 65, we are currently facing a significant shortfall in the number of retirement and accessible properties being built, and this needs to be addressed urgently. Amendment 80 would seek to ensure that positive consideration is given to applications for retirement and accessible housing developments being put forward for consideration. This will help address the imbalance and meet the needs of our ageing population and those with specific disability needs. I would therefore ask the committee to support Amendment 80 in my name. Can I also speak to Amendment 323? Uh, most people assume that disabled toilet caters for everyone with a disability. It does not. Amendment 323 seeks to address this. There is a, sh a shocking current lack of toilet facilities available across Scotland for people with profound and multiple learning difficulties, for those with di physical disabilities such as spinal injuries, and also those uh, who are older who have dementia. Amendment 53 calls for any large-scale new building planning application, such as a school, hospital, community centre or large retail shopping centre over 10,000 square metres, to include an accessible toilet in their plans that will cater for the needs of these individuals. Accessible toilets are specialist toileting facilities, a 12 square metre room that must contain equipment including a hoist, adjustment height changing bench and a room for two carers to be present. These facilities will allow individuals with complex needs the basic right to be included in society and be able to go out shopping for the day, to go to a trip to the cinema or has been able to go to the toilet safely and comfortably, something most of us take for granted. There is also an economic benefit if this amendment is passed, is that many people at the moment aren't able to go shopping or to the cinema or to other facilities because they know that they won't have the toilet if they require it. Currently, there are only 172 accessible toilets in Scotland, with only 10 here in Edinburgh, and pleased to say one is here in the Scottish Parliament, and that is why I am moving Amendment 323 in my name to ensure disabled people and older people are included in plans for large-scale developments in the future. I would also ask the committee to look favourably on uh, Mary Fee's amendment on a similar issue as well. Thank you, Convener. Thank you very much. Uh, Claudia Beamish to speak to Amendment 141 and other amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, amendment 141 is consequential on Amendment 140 and uh, perhaps the committee will be pleased to hear um, and those present will be pleased to hear that I do not intend to uh, move or press, depending on the terminology, this um, amendment because I had reassurances um, from both the Scottish Government and SEPA in relation to um, 140, which I withdrew previously um, in terms of permitted development rights. So um, uh, with the forbearance of the committee, that's my position on that. Um, uh, amendment 331. Um, is designed to ensure the planning system can be used to enable and support local decision makers to explicitly weigh up the long-term costs and implications of climate change impacts of development proposals against potentially competing considerations such as shorter-term economic considerations. This amendment is supported by Stop Climate Chaos, um, a broad coalition of groups um, including trade unions and community groups and churches. Uh, as well as NGOs. It is important that decisions in housing and transport planning, for example, are based on comprehensive information regarding the environmental impacts from infrastructure. Current practice is generally, frankly, poor in terms of life cycle considerations of energy use and contributions to greenhouse gas emissions. Requiring that national and major developments conduct a life cycle greenhouse gas emissions assessment would help decision makers make more informed judgments in weighing up project proposals, leading to more sustainable development and avoiding investment now that won't serve us all well in the future. The amendment would oblige a planning authority to consider the likely impact of developments of greenhouse gas emissions, as it says in the amendment itself, 
on achieving national greenhouse gas emissions reduction targets. And I do note that at the moment that says um, the Climate Change Act 2009, so it may be that um, further consideration has to be taken, even if there is a keenness on this amendment, uh, as we are at the moment considering um, uh, another bill in our, in our um, well, the Scottish Government bill in committee. The life cycle of greenhouse gas emissions means, and I quote again from my amendment, the emissions associated with the construction, operation and decommissioning of a development. And um, I believe very strongly that Scotland must future-proof um, in this area. Um, amendment 2.3.0 would require community open space to be a condition of planning permission for developments of four or more dwellings. This is a probing amendment, and it defines community open space as space with green infrastructure for civic areas and excludes parking spaces from falling under that definition. It is about creating, in my view, positive living spaces for people, setting the tone for more communal environments with potential benefits in health, air quality, local economy, inequality issues, and general mental well-being. <coughs> Homes for Scotland highlighted concerns about this amendment in relation to risking already marginal activity and making it unviable. Though I understand, as a representative for South Scotland, which is mostly rural, or partly rural anyway, um, I do strongly believe that Scottish residents have a right to public community spaces where they live. Similarly, uh, similarly to Amendment 227, um, which has already been considered on the play sufficiency assessment, this amendment highlights the importance of our spaces, our living spaces and placemaking, with an emphasis on the need for community space in our housing developments. And finally, I would like to speak positive, positively about Mark Ruskell's Amendment 318. This is a... Uh, yes. Thank you. Um, I just want to go back to uh, Amendment 230, um, which deals with um, the requirement uh, to provide community open space. Yes. Uh, and, uh, and the amendment says that should be for any development of four or more houses. Yes. So let's assume you have a development of just four houses, mm -hmm. a very small development. Mm -hmm. how, how on earth uh, is someone who's just building four houses meant to provide community open space in every case? Now, perhaps you could answer that, and perhaps you could. Yes, you, you, said at, you said at the start this is a probing amendment. Yes. I don't yes. know whether you intend to move it or not. Perhaps you could indicate in your response whether that's the case. Uh, well, I'd like to hear the, the comments of other members before I make a decision about whether to move or not. But it is a, pro a probing amendment, as I say. Uh, I seem to be contradicting myself there. However, I, I, I think that um, it is very important to work out how do we get space. And I appreciate from the perspective of a, of a developer that um, that could be a space for another house in a marginal area. But there are often houses, frankly, which are very, very close together and with no... Um, viable community space for, um, for, for people who live there. And these issues around loneliness and mental health and, and other issues are profoundly important for our communities. So four may not be the right number. Uh, you know, I recognise that. It was, it was a way of starting it off. Um, and I, I, I think I, w I would leave that, uh, you know, where it is um, and, and see where we go with it. Um, and as I say, finally, um, Mark um, Ruskell's Amendment 318 is a significant amendment on protecting our communities against air pollution. Um, and I appreciate that he has removed the previous amendment and it's only now about major developments. And having been on, uh, taken evidence in the Eclair Committee um, in, the summer, uh, in the summertime and through last year uh, on air pollution, this is a serious issue for our communities and significant numbers of people in Scotland actually die every year from this as a contributory factor. And I think it needs to be assessed as a health issue. Uh, so I will leave it at that, Karina. Thank you. Thank you very much, Claudia. Uh, Alec Cole-Hamilton to speak to Amendment 208 and other amendments in the group. 
Thank you very much, Convener. It's great to be back. Good morning to the committee. Thank you for having me. Um, my Amendment 208 speaks to um, a proliferation of housing uh, development in my constituency and many other constituencies. I should say from the outset, Liberal Democrats are not instinctively or ideologically opposed to new housing. Indeed, Edinburgh needs new housing. Scotland needs new housing. Um, this amendment uh, speaks to the correspondence I've received from uh, constituents, many constituents and community groups. Um, and is resonant throughout my party and all the local authority groups who have uh, lib of Liberal Democrats who have submitted uh, responses to me in uh, the conduct of this act. Um, this is about strengthening um, a presumption towards brown the use of brownfield light, uh, land in housing development. Um, we have had a situation in Edinburgh in particular where uh, brownfield land was zoned for development as early as 2003. Um, prior to the crash um, and never built upon. Uh, some outpost communities were established there with where lots of people bought houses with the expectations that communities would be growing up around them, schools would be built, um, uh, transport infrastructure enhanced, only to see the economic downturn, uh, see developers move away from um, plans to develop that land and instead favouring plans to uh, develop more lucrative greenbelt land where they could exact a higher premium um, for the purchase. So the amendment really seeks to um, spell out to developers that they have to uh, give due consideration to brownfield uh, land that that they might establish development on. They need to give adequate reasoning why they dismiss that. Um, and the local, it gives the final um, clause in the amendment, gives the a power to local authorities uh, to reject a development on greenfield land if it um, deems it uh, a, an intrinsic natural cultural heritage value. Um, and, and I think that speaks to many of the developments we see, in, particularly in my constituency, but I know in other members' um, constituencies as well. So I'm uh, happy to be here, and thanks for the opportunity to speak to it. Thank you very much. Uh, John Finney to speak to Amendment 294 and other amendments in the group. Uh, thank you very much, Convener, and good morning. Yes, um, we are in the, the section of the legislation covering the termination of applications, and people may therefore be a bit surprised to see the word demolition feature uh, in this. But it, it is the case that uh, planning uh, authorities must receive uh, grant permission for a development quote for a development that involves the demolition of a, a building. Now, uh, my amendment uh, refers to the Housing Scotland Act 2006. This is a very commendable piece of legislation that ensures that the highest standards are applied and these standards if a landlord isn't prepared to, to put them in place are enforced by way of a, a repairing standard enforcement order. Now um, strange though this may seem um, and this is an actual case that I'm dealing with very much a live case <coughs> um, that uh, as, at the moment rather than undertake that repairing standard enforcement a rogue landlord and the Highlands and Islands, like many urban areas, is blessed with a number of those, um, um, and a strong history of abuse in relation to relationship with housing and uh, occupancy, um, could seek to circumvent, and someone has sought to circumvent, uh, putting in place a repairing standard enforcement order by applying for demolition. So um, this piece of legislation would ensure that were such an order in place, uh, then it, that couldn't take place. I'm going to confine myself simply to the comments of the two, two amendments I have. The, the next one relates to uh, the Ramsar Convention. And uh, Ramsar sites, for those that don't know, are internationally important wetland sites identified for protection by the Ramsar Convention. Mm -hmm. And it is the Scottish Government's policy to apply the same level of, level of protection to Ramsar sites as that which is afforded to, uh, to designated Natura sites. Now, the, the piece of legislation in question is the Conservation uh, Natural Habitats Regulations 94, um, and that gave legal protection to Natura sites in Scotland. The habitat regulations ensure that any plan or project that may damage a Natura site is assessed and can only go ahead if certain strict conditions are met. Uh, this process is known as the Habitats Regulations Appraisal, one aspect of which is an appropriate assessment. As Ramsar sites are not specifically listed in the habitat regulations, <coughs> excuse me, it's un unclear how the Scottish Government policy to give these sites the same level of protection as Natura sites should be implemented. Now, my, my colleague Mark Ruskell previously, in a previous session of the Parliament, um, proposed an amendment to the Nature Conservation Bill on this ferry, and at the time, uh, the response from Alan Wilson stated, and I quote here, Ramsar sites in Scotland are already well protected through existing designations, so there is, strictly speaking, no need 
for the, the kind of additional mechanism. However, that's incorrect. This, uh, as the listed features of our AMSR site in Scotland are not always covered by underlying designations, or in some cases, uh, cases are only protected by a, a lower level triple SI designation, which does not provide the equivalent level of protections in Natura site. So the plan and bill gives an opportunity to demonstrate the Scottish Government's commitment to this important international obligation, and I hope that uh, opportunity will be seized by the Minister. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, Graeme Simpson to speak to Amendment 324 and other amendments in the group. Thanks uh, very much, Convener. Um, amendment 324 deals with biodiversity. Um, I've spoken quite a bit already about the need to deliver more housing in the right places, but this shouldn't be at the expense of biodiversity. The concept of net biodiversity gain is increasingly well recognised in environmental assessments. It requires that development leaves biodiversity, I'll get it right, uh, in a better state than before. It's particularly important to secure this requirement as there's currently no statutory system for ensuring impacts on biodiversity are mitigated out with designated sites. Residual cumulative effects are particularly hard to address. A requirement to provide biodiversity net gain would help Scotland meet its obligations and targets. England's 25-year um, environment plan states that, quote, we will seek to embed a net environmental gain principle for development to deliver environmental improvements locally and nationally. And I consider that Scotland should also be looking to achieve this. The amendment's not particularly taxing. It says that if a planning authority thinks there could be an effect on biodiversity from a development, it should consider that. Just consider it. Then, having considered that, the authority should only grant permission if it's satisfied that there will there'll be net positive effects on biodiversity from the development. Frankly, if we want to improve habitats and make great places for people to live, then this is one way of doing it. And it ties in nicely with other amendments looking at health. Amendment 323, uh, in the name of Jeremy Balfour, uh, deals with the provision of specialist toilet facilities in large developments. Convener, the amendment is a thing of beauty, much like Mr Balfour. We initially thought that this may be something that would sit better uh, in building regulations, but on reflection, uh, we think planning can help. Uh, we can also support Mary Fee's amendment to this, which adds to the list of buildings covered. Um, convener, I strongly support Alex Cole Hamilton, and it's uh, not often I've been able to say that, um, and his amendment 208. We can help to regain trust in our planning system by ensuring that development takes place on Brownfield instead of previous Greenbelt, where this is feasible, uh, and this amendment helps to achieve that. An application to build on Greenbelt would not be able to be approved unless there's a statement by the applicant setting out why the proposed development can't be achieved on brownfield land. As you know, um, I had a brownfield land amendment which I didn't move, but assuming Mr Cole Hamilton presses his, he'll have our support. Um, turning to Mark Ruskell's Air Quality Zone Amendment 318, um, he has presented this with the best of intentions, but despite him rewording it, I do think there could still be unintended consequences. I think if the amendment went through, then almost any road, any large industrial development, uh, large retail development, restaurants, hou housing development could be rejected uh, on the grounds that they might cause some pollution. Uh, we do want to protect the environment. I've mentioned that previously, uh, but I think it's a, a question of balance. John Finney's uh, amendment. Uh, yes, certainly. Can, thank the member for taking a, an intervention. Um, all the amendment requires is consideration of adequate mitigation. So if there was a road uh, that was being built, uh, fine, um, but there has to be consideration of what the mitigation is in, in terms of air pollution. That really does reflect uh, what we already have in, in terms of law, um, in, in, in terms of the requirements set in air quality management area and to take decisions that are consistent with that. So it isn't about stopping things, it's about ensuring that we mitigate the impact of things that are being constructed. 
Yeah, I, I, th I think it's a question of unintended consequences. It could be used to stop things that uh, would be desirable. Um, I would simply urge Mr. Ruskell, um, uh, if, if this is defeated, I've no idea what will happen, to maybe think again for stage three uh, and have further discussions. Um, John Finney's amendment 294 says that planning authorities must not, must not grant planning permission for a development if it involved knocking down a building that should have been repaired. Um, now, I can see where he's coming from, but I think uh, uh, he should perhaps have been a bit more flexible. A better form of wording uh, would be may not, as that allows for some flexibility. Uh, so we can't support the amendment in its current form. Uh, Claudia Beamish's amendment uh, 230, um, which I questioned her on previously about um, providing community open space uh, of developments of four or more houses. Um, I think it's, uh, frankly, um, if I may use the word ridiculous, um, unachievable um, on, on a, a development of that size. A development of four houses is small, uh, and I can't really see how every single development of that size could possibly meet Miss Beamish's demands. Yes. I haven't had a chance to speak to Claudia in detail about her proposal, but I'm thinking there could be situations, because in the committee we've talked about trying to encourage um, smaller builders, small-scale developments. Um, I'm not sure if Claudia's thinking about that cumulative impact, where you could have in smaller settlements um, these small-scale developments, say of four units or, or maybe under ten units, and that could be the way to fill in gap sites. And I, I suppose maybe what Claudia Beamish has in mind is that um, if you have um, a, a grouping of small developments, then there could be a risk that there's no contribution to community open space, and it's a way to, um, you know, maybe um, increase that provision. But I, I think it's not without its challenges. I think Claudia Beamish has recognised that. I think she's accepted the challenges. I, I, I see I'm Kenny Gibson stood up his face. I don't know if he wanted to come in, but no. I think it's good yeah, that we debate these things. I completely agree with what the chair through the convener. Uh, yes, thank you. you know, I mean, I'm thinking about my own communities, and I think there's a lot of gap sites that have been filled in. Some of them are, are, have been derelict for years, and people have come in and put five, six, seven houses in. And frankly, if there was a need to put in these community spaces that have been discussed, they simply would not have went forward with these developments. So it's just a deterrent to actually filling in a lot of gap sites in, in, in towns and in, 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 in cities. Uh, I, I think the, the thing about, you know, what, what Monica's trying desperately to do to try and rescue <laughs> Claudia in this particular thing in terms of small villages is, is something that I don't think we're really taking it seriously, frankly. All right, OK. Thank you very much. <coughs> Back to Graham. <clears throat> Okay, um, so I, I, I can see. Um, I mean, <laughs> Enough time on that one. G it's actually a valid point. Okay, It'd then. Be very brief. Can you make well, it? Well, you have to. Yes. Actually, yes. I just have to intervene on me. That's fair point. Are you looking to intervene? Yes. I haven't even spoken yet. Yeah, yeah. That's intervene. always the best time, Graham. Right. <laughs> 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 you can intervene. Uh, I, 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 you want I would to like to intervene on, uh, on. on the. Graham, on are you happy to take yes, I'll take the intervention. Thank you. Thank you, Convener. That Graham Simpson has already raised. And this was a probing amendment. And I, I, I think there may well be other ways of doing this. And Monica's raised that. It, it, it actually is not ridiculous to look at people's mental health and at the, oh, at the, the possibilities of green spaces yeah. where. Of, of your no, position. But I am, no. Convener, with respect. It, it, it is important that we have green spaces in our communities. Now, it may it be that it might be there could be a fund in, in the local authority under, under stage three, which um, others have, have discussed with me since I put in this amendment. Uh, it may be there are other ways of doing it, but we cannot go on having people crowded in together without space right. for amenity. Claudia, you made those points uh, in, in your previous comments. Yes, but I'm and, and we will, we will get a response from the Minister very shortly. Graham, are you still to continue? Yes. Yeah. Just <laughs> very, very, very briefly. <laughs> yes, um, yes, yes. Good, good to spark a debate, though, um, convener. Um, I, I think um, to, for, for Claudia Beamish to, to mention green spaces and uh, mental health, well, I think every single member of this committee, frankly, <laughs> Uh, is in favour of green spaces. Every single member of this committee uh, sees the value um, uh, and the value in um, helping to prevent uh, mental health. Um, but we have to look at the wording of the amendment, and it uh, uh, deals with um, ti potentially tiny 
developments. Claud Claudia Beamish represents a rural area um, where you could have, uh, for example, small courtyard developments of four, five, five properties where there, there just wouldn't be the space to provide community open space, uh, you know, however valuable that may be. So I, I will we'll certainly not be supporting it if she presses it. Um, also, um, sadly, can't support Claudia Beamish's Amendment 331. Um, it would be impossible for a planning authority, in my view, to assess, quotes, the likely impact of the development's life cycle <coughs> greenhouse gas emissions on achieving national greenhouse gas emissions reductions targets. I just think that is far too onerous for councils. Uh, and I shall leave it there. Thank you. Uh, Mary Fee to speak to Amendment 323A and other amendments in the group. Thank you, Convener, and good, good morning, everyone. I will speak to my own Amendment 323A and also in support of Amendment 323 in the name of Jeremy Balfour. Amendment 323 and 323A both serve to strengthen the Planning Scotland Bill by including a statutory provision for the inclusion of changing places toilet facilities within certain new large developments. Changing places toilets are essential for people living with profound and multiple learning difficulties, as well as other disabilities that severely limit mobility and people that are unable to use standard accessible toilets, disabled toilets. In February 2009, the British Standard 8300 Code of Practice was published. This Code of Practice provided guidance on the design of buildings to ensure they met the needs of disabled people and outlined the specifications for changing places toilets. Amendment 323 attempts to enshrine in legislation the recommended British standard dimension for changing places toilets. As the amendment outlines, changing places toilets should be a minimum of 12 square metres to allow two carers to assist an adult to use the toilet. My amendment, Amendment 323A, supplements and strengthens Amendment 323. The British Standard 8300 recommends nine categories of larger buildings and complexes which should provide a changing place toilet. Amendment 323 covers four of these categories. My amendment adheres to the British Standard recommendations to provide standardisation of the provision of changing place toilets by making them a legal requirement in cultural centres such as museums, concert halls and art galleries, stadia and large auditoria, major transport termini and interchanges and motorway service facilities. At present, the provision of changing place toilets is sporadic and inadequate as there is no legal requirement for large buildings and complexes to provide facilities which comply with the British Standard 8300. And to give one small example, at present there are only two changing place toilets on Scotland's road networks, with both located on the M74 at Cairn Lodge Services near Les Mahago and Annandale Water Services near Lockerbie. There is a growing awareness around the necessity of changing places toilets, and it is estimated that over a quarter of a million people across the UK need changing places toilets to enable them to get out of their house and go about their day-to-day -day activities. And I believe that the Scottish Parliament should lead the rest of the UK on the issue of changing places toilets. And from an equalities and human rights perspective, the passage of amendments 323 and 323A would ensure that our public buildings, our shared spaces and the wider built environment are more accessible, more inclusive and responsive to the basic needs of all members of our society. Changing places toilets are vital and potentially life-changing facilities. Their introduction in new developments would ensure greater accessibility and inclusivity for carers and for individuals who require these facilities. And the reality is that without access to a suitable changing bench and hoist, many people with complex disabilities are forced to choose between lying on an unhygienic toilet floor or becoming trapped in their own home. And I would urge the committee to support both Amendment 323 and Amendment 323A. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now the Minister to speak to Amendment 263 and other amendments in the group. Uh, convener, I'll start by explaining Amendment 263 in my name, uh, which is largely technical, and then move on to the policy issues raised by other amendments in this group. 
Uh, section 58 of the 1997 Act deals with when planning permission expired, expires if development has not begun. Uh, the default is three years from when permission is granted. Subsection 4C provides an exemption to avoid a temporary planning permission with a very short life, having a default requirement to begin development by a date after the per permission itself has expired. However, these days, even large-scale and long-term developments can have time limits or decommissioning strategies or reinstatement requirements specified in planning permission and thus be technically temporary. Uh, the risk is that the exemption may also apply to some of these permissions or that there is uncertainty as whether it does or not. Uh, this would mean such permissions could exist permanently uh, with communities and planning authorities not knowing if or when development might be started. This amendment therefore removes that exemption so that temporary planning permission is subject to the normal rules and when it expires, and I hope that the committee will support this amendment. Uh, the remainder of the amendments in this group all seek in one way or another to limit the ability of planning authorities to determine uh, applications for planning permission according to the circumstances of individual cases. Um, and uh, Mr Simpson, uh, mentioned unintended consequences. I think that a number of these amendments very certainly do have unintended consequences. Um, I've made clear, um, convener, throughout that I do not agree uh, with uh, uh, centralising and inflexible approaches. Uh, above all, it does not allow authorities to balance the different issues that arise against one another to arrive at the best overall decision. Um, I'm going to make exceptions, though, um, for Amendments 323 in the name of Jeremy Balfour uh, and Mary Fee's amendment to that amendment. Uh, I recognise the importance of changing places' toilets to the lives of people with profound uh, and multiple learning disabilities and to their families and carers. Um, and I'd like to thank Mr Balfour uh, for raising this issue, supported by Mary Fee, and I'd like to thank Mr Balfour for working constructively with officials to ensure that we got the best possible amendment here. Um, I certainly want to make sure that any new large public building is provided with these facilities, uh, but we must be pr proportionate, um, uh, avoiding anomalies such as every new classroom extension uh, requiring its own changing places toilet. Um, Amendment 323 uh, provides for regulations to refine the developments to which the requirement would apply and the specification of the facil facilities required so that it can be kept up to date with changes in technology and changes in standards. And that is very, very helpful. Uh, the Scottish Government, uh, under my instruction, has already been working to introduce these facilities um, through building standard system. Uh, with a working group set up to develop proposals for public consultation. Uh, we will need uh, to work through how the two regimes um, should interact, uh, but I would ask the committee to support Je Jeremy Balfour and Mary Fee's amendments today. Um, I also support, in principle, uh, the principle behind uh, John Finney's uh, Amendment 331. Uh, relating to the protection of Ramsar sites. Uh, of course, I cannot comment on any live planning application that may have inspired this amendment from Mr Finney. Can I make some progress and then I'll take you in? I think it's clarification. Uh, I'll take you in in a wee bit. Um, however, uh, 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 Minister, I think it's clarification about the amendment number. OK, on you go. John. <clears throat> the particular amendment that I uh, proposed, uh, Minister Walsh. I, I beg your pardon, 335. Uh, 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 thank you, Mr. Philly. Thank you. Um, uh, the, government, the government has already confirmed that its policy is to give the same level of protection uh, to Ramsar sites as European protected sites. The, the amendment would mean this is not a matter of policy, but a legal restriction. However, for technical reasons, I cannot support the amendment as drafted. 
Uh, firstly, the approach is not ideal, as European sites are supported through regulations rather than primary legislation. The majority of Ramsar sites in Scotland are also European sites, and so I'm concerned about duplicating assessments unnecessarily. Uh, furthermore, uh, the language and terminology will require technical adjustment. Um, I wonder if Mr Finney has fully considered uh, whether transposing the wording that was drafted for European protected sites will technically work for Ramsar sites, given that they are designated in a different way. I also think that we should ensure that any definitions are consistent with those elsewhere in the legislation. Um, I would be happy to work with Mr Finney on this matter and would ask him to withdraw the amendment to allow for further discussion. Um, amendment 80, in the name of Jeremy Balfour, uh, demonstrates the difficulties of attempting to set a new basis for determination of applications without also making it clear how this might fit in with the uh, existing duty to determine applications for planning permission in accordance with the de development plan unless material consider considerations indicate otherwise. Uh, it does not set out uh, what is considered to be housing that is suitable for older people and those with disabilities, or even how old is older. Not all disabilities require physical adaptations to a house, so this assumption could potentially apply to all housing as it would be suitable for some older people and some people with disabilities. Even if some accessibility standards are applied, the houses could be completely inappropriate for the location. In what circumstances could the planning authority override this presumption in favour of agreement? It's not clear. The committee has agreed a range of amendments that will ensure housing for older people and disabled people has a prominent place in the development plan, in addition to existing policy. Decisions based on, the, on those plans and policies should therefore deliver appropriate housing for older people and disabled people, balancing all the other material considerations that may arise. It is not helpful to disrupt that system, and I ask the committee not to support these amendments. Uh, Mr Cole Ham Hamilton would like anyone applying for planning permission in the Green Belt to identify some brownfield land that is not suitable for their development and explain why they didn't choose to develop there. That would not only apply to new development, uh, but also to anyone wanting to extend their existing home in the Green Belt or perhaps to create facilities to help people enjoy the Green Belt. Scottish planning policy states that it is up to planning authorities uh, in preparing local development plans to decide whether to have a Green Belt in their area and what policies they should have to support it and define appropriate development within it. Uh, that will include appropriate protection uh, for the natural or cultural heritage value of the land as they themselves see fit. A decision based on the development plan will therefore give those issues appropriate weight. Where a development plan promotes the use of brownfield sites over any green belt land it designates, one would expect the applicant to provide a case for why they have gone for development in the green belt if alternative sites were possible. Where a planning authority goes to the trouble of designating a green belt and having policies to protect it that fits the needs of their area, it seems inappropriate to fetter the planning authority's ability to decide whether to grant planning permission or not in the way proposed by Amendment 208. Convener, I turn now to Mr Finney's Amendment 294, uh, which appears to be trying to use the planning system uh, to protect tenants. However, if a landlord decided not to comply with a repairing standard enforcement order and to demolish the building instead, having planning permission is not a green light to do so. Planning permission would not in itself override tenants' rights, although in some cases an intention to demolish the building, even if it's in perfectly good condition, may be grounds for eviction. 
The amendment also refers to work required under a repairing standard enforcement order not being completed. It is only the Housing and Property Chamber of the First Tier Tribunal for Scotland who can determine whether such works have been completed. Procedurally, this leaves the planning decision dependent on a determination of the tribunal and could potentially create a situation where planning permission could not be granted to demolish a building that was unsafe, for example, uh, or which uh, was blocking other needed development. Uh, Amendment 294, medals in a complex area where decisions really need to be taken on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, with regard to both the planning issues and the relevant tenancy provisions. And I'll take Mr Finney in uh, at that point. Uh, I note the Minister's comments and I, I concur with him that it is a very complex area and, and it is an area that uh, involves the Housing and Property Chamber and a decision ultimately with local authorities. Would he accept that this isn't some academic, I'm not drawing him into a particular case, but as things stand, a rogue landlord can circumvent housing legislation by applying to demolish the property, and that is simply unfair. I, I'm willing to speak um, to Mr Finney further uh, around about this issue, um, but as I've said on previous occasions and at the very beginning of this, there are unintended consequences to this amendment, as there are to many others here. Um, I would ask Mr uh, Finney not to press this amendment, um, but I am willing to talk to him uh, uh, about this further. Um, the other amendments in this group likewise deal with important issues, but much broader ones, uh, which may have uh, a range of solutions and therefore are more appropriately dealt with in policy and by planning authorities' judgment. Many of these amendments as drafted would have significant impacts, which I hope are unintended, uh, but which highlight the difficulty of such prescription. Um, my view is that the review of the National Planning Framework and Scottish Planning Policy is the best place to consider these issues in more detail and with the flexibility they need. And I hope that members will agree to work with me on that approach. Um, can I start with Mr Simpson's Amendment 324 uh, and Ms Beamish's 331? The environmental impact assessment regulations already require an assessment of the likely significant environmental effects of relevant developments and consideration of any measures to avoid, prevent, reduce or offset those effects. The, those regulations have their own criteria uh, for determining which developments need an assessment. Uh, they do not align exactly with national and major developments, but they do ensure that relevant projects are covered, including some local developments. Requiring a separate assessment uh, through planning legislation risks duplicating rather than streamlining procedures with no opportunity for screening to allow authorities to focus on development that will have significant impacts. Both biodiversity assessment and measurement of life cycle greenhouse gas emissions are highly specialised areas that can quickly become very complicated and could introduce significant cost and delay. That time and cost will fall to applicants to provide additional supporting information with their applications. It is, of course, important that significant development projects support our targets for reducing greenhouse gas emissions and are resilient to the impact of climate change in the long term. EIA includes an assessment of impacts relating to climate. There is not a specific requirement to undertake a life cycle analysis and methods can vary, but it is normal for them to cover all phases of development. I do not want to duplicate that, but perhaps we can arrive at a more proportionate solution. For example, I agree it would be useful uh, to undertake such an assessment of all the proposed national developments to be included in the National Planning Framework 4, and I would be happy with an amendment in those terms, so that the most significant long-term infrastructure projects in Scotland would be assessed in this way. But I'm more cautious about major developments where the consideration may not always be relevant or add value to existing assessments. 
Scottish planning policy states that the planning system should seek benefits for biodiversity for new development where that is possible. Mr Simpson's amendment has no doubt been informed by the UK government's approach to net biodiversity gain. However, the apparent, apparent simplicity of this amendment belies a complex policy area. On the basis that every proposed development may have an effect on biodiversity, however slight, the amendment would require measurements to ensure net positive effects on biodiversity for every development. That is, every home extension, every illuminated sign, every equipment store, uh, and if such measurements could not be secured, planning permission would have to be refused. While I understand the intention behind the amendment, fundamentally it could seriously risk stalling development of all kinds and undermining economic growth across the whole of Scotland. I believe that primary, primary legislation is too blunt an instrument to reflect the complexities involved in this issue. I, I will take Mr Simpson. Yeah. Thank you. Um, uh, uh, that's the second time that uh, the Minister has referred to house extensions um, in, uh, in his arguments. Um, now, if I was to build an extension onto my house, uh, I can assure you there would be no biodiversity effects. So I think, I think he's just going a bit, a bit too far um, in, you know, in his uh, objections. Uh, convener, um, I talked about unintended consequences. Uh, a number of these amendments today have these unintended consequences. I'm not going too far. I'm not scaremongering here. Th these are the consequences of these amendments on some very small developments. And I think, you know, the committee has to take cognizance of that. Um, you know, again, I'm willing to have uh, further discussions. I've already said that in terms of national planning framework for and national planning developments, I think, you know, there, uh, we can work together on some of that. But I do think that there are unintended consequences to a number of amendments in this group. And I do hope folk uh, will recognise that I am pointing these out to them uh, because these are the realities. Um, Mark Ruskell's Amendment 318 on air quality uh, could effectively ban major development uh, in some of our larger urban areas and limit the ability of a planning authority to use a range of solutions to mitigate or offset the effects of new development. Uh, we know that a major source of air, air pollution is from transport, uh, which is why Scottish planning policy sets out a framework for decision making on new development that is designed to reduce the need to travel and encourage sustainable transport or options, therefore reducing transport emissions. Arguably, this amendment could lead to perverse effects where major developments are forced to locate in less sustainable out of time locations to avoid air quality zones, even where action could be taken to mit mitigate any effects on air quality. The Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee recommended that air quality should be considered in the review of the National Planning Framework. Uh, and we will work to ensure that MPF 4 aligns with the package of measures in Scotland's strategy on cleaner air for Scotland, the road to a healthier future. Um, I'm glad that um, Ms Beamish uh, has said that she will not move and withdraw Amendment 141, because effectively that amendment would have given SEPA uh, uh, the, the powers to be decision maker uh, and give it a veto. Uh, in a number of cases. Um, let me turn to um, Amendment 230, um, again from Ms Beamish, which again removes flexibility from planning authorities and is not clear enough about what it requires. The Scottish Government previously commissioned research and carried out a detailed consultation on setting requirements for open space at a national level. This highlighted uh, a number of practical barriers to implementation, including the differences between urban and rural areas and the amount of community open space already available. There are differences in opinion 
over how the amount of open space required should be calculated and wider concerns about the impact on development viability, as Mr Gibson and Mr Simpson have pointed out. Uh, research carried out for Scottish natural heritage on developing green space standards found that many of the earlier open space standards have been implicated in the creation of poor spaces and developments with little sense of place. The amendment does not address these concerns. It does say how much open space uh, it does not say how much open space would be required and it would not allow off-site provision or improvement of existing green space in the area. And those are often good solutions for urban developments, especially flats, where open space cannot be provided on site. <coughs> Excuse me, convener, I recognise since that we last consulted on this issue, uh, there has been renewed interest um, in a national standard for green infrastructure and some potential models have been developed. I strongly believe that policy is the appropriate place uh, to include detailed but flexible requirements to make sure open space truly enhances our places. Convener, I would ask the committee to support uh, Amendment 263 in my name, uh, Amendments 323 and 323A uh, in the names of Jeremy Balfour and Mary Fee, and I urge the committee not to support the other amendments in the group. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. Um, Andy, you want to speak? Thank you, Convener. Just a brief few points for the, the record. The Minister's talked about unintended consequences. I'm sure members will um, listen to his views carefully, and those moving amendments will uh, take, take a view as to whether they wish to move uh, amendments or not. And if they do move uh, amendments, I'm sure, as the Minister said, he's open to discussions about how they may be refined at stage uh, three. I just want to support Mark Ruskell's Amendment 318. Uh, um, in my view, it's, 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 it's proportionate. The Minister argues that it couldn't, uh, wouldn't allow for mitigating uh, measures, uh, but with pre-application procedures and good con conversations with the planning application, uh, the question is that it only prohibits planning applications being granted where in the planning authority's mind, uh, opinion rather, it would have an adverse effect on the achievement of the limit value in an air quality management zone. Those can all be resolved prior to submitting the formal uh, application. I think it's quite a proportionate amendment to ensure that we are not in breach of the law. Uh, Mark, Jeremy Balfour's Amendment uh, 80, I cannot uh, uh, support. It, um, it uh, uh, invites planning authorities to proceed on, on assumptions that applications will normally be granted for two uh, very worthy types of development, but nevertheless, I think there's risks that that could override valuable provisions in the local development plan. Uh, in extremis, uh, it could it could pr provide that um, such developments as are contained in the amendment would be built in the middle of, of parks, for example. In 2.30, uh, Claudia Beamish's uh, amendment, um, I understand where she's coming from, um, but the uh, Edinburgh North Leith constituency, for example, which is in Lothian, where I represent, is the most densely populated part of Scotland. Um, and uh, there are many gap sites that need to be filled and there are tenement, or tenement properties. And tenement properties, by definition, cannot provide community open space uh, within the footprint of the development. Although I know the, the, um, the, uh, the amendment talks about... Um, sorry, I should find the amendment. It, to it talks about, in the section, community open space means space within or on the edge of settlements. So in theory, one could provide a, for an application to build some tenements in Leith and the community open space is five miles away in the Pentland Hills. Um, so I think there's important stuff in here, but I don't think I could support it at the moment in primary legislation. Uh, John Finney's amendment to... On it's just a clarification, because I think the Minister said in respect to amendment 230 that... Um, it was talking about the footprint of sites and it didn't allow for off-site provision. But Andy Whiteman's helpfully pointed out in Claudia's, Claudia Beamish's amendment, she provides some definition of what community open space means. So again, I think maybe there's been a misunderstanding, but 
I, I agree. I think there's work to be done on on the amendment. Uh, th um, clarify, um, because the amendment uh, does not say how much open space would be required, and it does not allow off-site provision or improvement of existing green space in the area. Um, I, I think you know I'm pointing out these things. Um, you know I have uh, had legal officials and others um, working on this, looking at the purpose and effect of all of these amendments. You know, I've shared purpose and effect documents um, with committee members uh, around about this. These are the situations. There are unintended consequences uh, to these things. I am pointing these out. Those uh, are the effects of these amendments. I thank, thank the Minister for his intervention. Um, and finally, in John Finney's Amendment 294, um, I understand the points the Minister's made here. This is a loophole uh, that has been attempted to close. It's a conflict that needs to be uh, resolved, and I hope John Finney will be uh, moving this amendment. I'll be supporting it. Um, and the, um, some of the uh, work that needs to be done to uh, give it full uh, legal effect, um, I'm sure, can be done uh, before Stage 3. Thank you. Thank you. And Monica, I believe you want to come in briefly. Thank you, Kim Peter. Yeah, just briefly to speak um, to the record about a couple of these amendments. Um, on Mark Ruskell's 318, um, I strongly support um, that amendment uh, and I agree with Mark Ruskell that it is important to embed air quality into development plans. Um, and I think the, the points that Andy White has made about, we're talking about air quality management zones, um, I think brings some perspective and proportionality to this. Um, on Jeremy Balfour's 323. Um, uh, Monica Lennon, please, convener. On that. Um, Go ahead. Uh, convener, Ms. Lennon just talked about embedding air quality in development plans. This amendment is not about development plans, it is about applications, individual applications. And I think that point needs to be made. This is not about development plans. This is about individual applications. Thank you. No, I don't dispute the clarification. I think um, maybe I misquoted Mark Ruskell because I've been told to be brief here, but I think, I think we understand it is about assessing planning applications in air quality management zone areas. Um, if I move on to Jeremy Balfour's 323 and Mary Fee's related 323A, um, I would echo that the Minister's remarks would really commend Jeremy Balfour and Mary Fee for bringing forward these um, amendments. I think the committee has discussed at length that, that in public health terms, access to toilet facilities is, is absolutely crucial and it shouldn't be an afterthought. And we have heard that at times um, equalities impact assessments are, are not robust enough. Uh, we know that the quality impact assessment for this bill has been criticised. So I think that that's a bit of a weak link we need to look at. So I support these amendments. Um, I think Mary Fee's work, particularly on, on changing places, um, has really been tremendous. And I also congratulate the Minister for his commitment on that issue. It does bring me back to a, a previous amendment in Alison Johnson's name, where we did have another lively debate. And, and Alison Johnson, um, again, was, was trying to make sure that planning authorities consider how the provision of public toilets uh, is addressed in their areas. And she was proposing that a statement would go into local plans. Now, she, she was successful. I think the vote was 4-3, but I recall that the minister was arguing against that. So I hope there has been a change of heart because that would be positive. Um, on um, 80, amendment... Um, 80, on 80... Uh, maybe just to save time, I, I won't be moving Amendment 80 uh, today. Um, I do think it, there is some work that maybe I could hopefully do to clarify the situation at stage three, but maybe just to save a few words, I won't be moving uh, Amendment 80 uh, this morning. Thank you very okay. much, well, move on. I welcome that. I think that's sensible. I think we support the spirit of it, but I think there's some problems in the way it's been framed, um, certainly around the language like assumptions. And normally, I think that's quite difficult in development management um, terms. Um, 
Alex Cole Hamilton, I'll just briefly say that support Amendment 208. Well done. Um, on Claudia Beamish's 230, I didn't expect there would be so much discussion about it. I think Claudia Beamish has set out that it is indeed a probing um, amendment. I think it shows some of the, the difficulties in perception around what would be a reasonable contribution to community open space, which, based on my reading of the amendment, isn't about necessarily what's in the footprint of an application site, but the wider contribution within a town, within a settlement, um, particularly when we have a perhaps a, a number, um, as an accumulation of smaller developments, if they were all quite high density and none of them making a, a contribution to community open space, that could lead to difficulties. Um, so I wasn't desperately trying to salvage Claudia Beamish's um, amendment. That's the matter for Claudia Beamish, but I, I welcome the discussion that we've had um, around that. Um, on John Finney's 294, it sounds like there's quite a, maybe a serious case behind it, um, but I think it does need some further work. So if John Finney is pressing, I don't think I'd be able to support that one today. Thank you, convener. Thank you very much. Uh, Mark Russell to wind up and press or withdraw. Uh, thank you, convener. I will resist speaking to every single amendment in, <laughs> in the group. Thank you, um, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> tempted as I am, but um, uh, perhaps just, just briefly reflect on John Finney's amendment around Ramsar. I, I do vaguely remember the, the discussions in session two with Alan Wilson at the time, and I, and I think you know it's important that we, we, we revisit our international environmental obligations um, particularly now as we, we head towards a, a post-Brexit um, environmental governance uh, arrangements uh, in the UK and Scotland. So you know, I'd welcome further discussions with John and, and the Minister around that. Um, turning to 318, uh, my amendment on AQMAs and air pollution. I mean, I'm, I'm disappointed that uh, you know, our legal obligations under European law uh, continue to be seen as just part of the balance of issues that needs to be uh, discussed at local level in relation to individual planning applications. Um, I, I think that misunderstands the, uh, the importance and the purpose of European law in protecting human health. And I'm sure that the exchanges today in this committee will uh, give food for thought for those uh, considering further legal challenge about the UK as a state uh, inability to, uh, to adequately embed European law around air quality into plans and programs. Um, I mean, notwithstanding that, um, you know, I, I, I think the minister's point around um, mysterious unintended consequences is, is one to reflect on, and I'd welcome further discussion with him and his officials between now and stage three, if that was something that he was minded to engage in. Um, the purpose of this amendment is, as I said, not to stop development per se. It is to push uh, for further options around mitigation to be discussed at the earlier uh, pre-planning phase. Um, that's the purpose of this amendment. It does apply to individual applications because it's at that level uh, which environmental assessment takes place, traffic impact assessment takes place, where we have a good evidential basis uh, to consider the impact of the development and the mitigation options that may flow from that. Um, so with that in mind, um, I would be minded at this point, stage two, not to move the amendment uh, pending further discussions uh, with the minister. And I'll consider uh, what options we can put forward. Uh, go on then, I'm mid um, but... Just to say that I'm more than happy to have uh, the discussions with Mr. Ruskell. Well, I think that's the last word then, isn't it? So, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So can I just clarify then, uh, Mr. Ruskell, Mark, that you wish to withdraw the amendment? Wish to withdraw the amendment. Thank you. Uh, Mark Russell wishes to withdraw the amendment. Does any member present object to this amendment being withdrawn? Thank you. In that case, the amendment is withdrawn. I call amendment 80 in the name of Jeremy Balfour, already debated with amendment 318. Jeremy Balfour to move or not move? Uh, not move. Thank you. Call amendment 141 in the name of Claudia Beamish, already debated with amendment 318. Claudia Beamish to move or not move? Not move. Thank you. Call Amendment 208 in the name of Alec Cole Hamilton. Already debated with Amendment 318. Alec Cole Hamilton to move or not move? I'd like to move, please, Convener. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 208 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Those in favour of Amendment 208? It's four. Those opposed? Three. The amendment therefore is agreed. Call Amendment 294 in the name of John Finney. Already debated with Amendment 318. 
John Finney to move or not move? I'm able to comment, Camille. No, you're able to move or not move? Um, I, I will not move. Thank you. Uh, call Amendment 324 in the name of Graham Simpson. Already debated with Amendment 318. Graham Simpson to move or not move? Move. The question is that Amendment 324 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Those in favour of Amendment 324? Three. Those opposed? Oh, sorry. Four. Uh, the amendment 324 falls. I call amendment 258 in the name of Lewis MacDonald. Already debated with amendment 2. <coughs> Lewis MacDonald to move or not move? Move. Commander. Thank you. The question is that amendment 258 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Those in favour of amendment 258? Four. Those opposed? Three. Amendment 258 is agreed to. I call Amendment 331 in the name of Claudia Beamish, already debated with Amendment 318. Claudia Beamish to move or not move? Not move. Thank you. I call Amendment 1 in the name of Adam Tompkins, already debated with Amendment 2. Uh, is anybody moving this on behalf of Adam Tompkins? Thank you. The question is that Amendment 1 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Those in favour of Amendment 1? Four. Those opposed? Three. Amendment one is agreed to. Are we okay there? No. Uh, okay. I call amendment three two three in the name of Jeremy Balfour already debated with amendment three one eight. Jeremy Balfour to move or not move? Move. Thank you. The question is that amendment three oh call amendment three two three in the name of Mary Fee already debated with amendment three one eight. That's what I said. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My apologies, Mary. Mary Fee to move or not move? Moved, Convener. The question is that Amendment 323 be agreed to? A, a again. <laughs> Yeah. I, I'm, I'm going to say it's not in my sheet, but I'd be lying. Uh, the question is that Amendment 323A be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Uh, Jeremy Balfour to press or withdraw Amendment 323? Uh, move. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 323 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. I call Amendment 2... Th I'm glad to get that one out of the road. Uh, <laughs> I call Amendment 230 in the name of Claudia Beamish. Already debated with Amendment 318. Claudia Beamish to move or not move? Not move. Thank you. Therefore, the question is that Section 15 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Thank you. Uh, we'll now have a short break. Uh, Five-minute comfort break.
I call Amendment 259 in the name of the Minister, grouped with amendments as shown in the groupings. Minister, to move Amendment 259 and speak to all amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, throughout the review of the planning system, our consultations and Stage 1 of the Bill, I have made clear that following the passage of this Bill, uh, we will consult on revising the structure and levels of planning fees and charges in light of the new structure of the planning system. Uh, this is in recognition of the fact that there is a need to move towards full cost recovery uh, to be able to appropriately fund the reformed planning system. Income from planning applications does not currently meet the costs of processing those applications. Uh, a number of possible changes to fees have already been suggested. Uh, the bill includes a number of adjustments to the powers to make regulations about fees to ensure we are able to implement those suggestions if they are supported in the consultation that will follow. My amendments in this group add to those adjustments. Uh, one suggestion uh, that has been made is that applicants should be able to pay a higher fee um, for a fast-track service. An authority would probably need to provide a dedicated staff resource to provide this service without detriment to other applications. Uh, we've already, we already have sufficient powers to charge a different fee for such a fer uh, service. However, currently applicants can only agree an extended timescale for determining an application and only after submitting their application and paying the appropriate fee. This timescale relates to when the applicant can bring an appeal or request a review on grounds of non-determination. Amendments 259 to 262 uh, would allow an authority and prospective applicant to agree a timescale which is longer or shorter than the standard period and do so before submitting the application. If the application is to be fast-tracked, the authority will then be able to charge the appropriate fee. Section 21.7 of the Bill uh, amends the powers on fees regulations to allow a surcharge to be imposed over and above the normal fee where a planning application is made after the development has been carried out. Retrospective applications create a lot of frustration where people are felt to be flighting uh, the planning system. And there has been, uh, and there has been substantial support for charging higher fees in this situation. However, uh, the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee uh, recommended that there should be some form of restriction on how or the circumstances in which this power could be exercised. Uh, in these particular circumstances, we agree that a limit would be appropriate. Amendment 266 uh, therefore provides that the surcharge cannot be more than the standard fee for the application. In other words, the retrospective charge cannot be more than twice the normal fee. Our consultation on fees will consider what the level should be uh, within that limit. Uh, the bill provides for the Scottish ministers to charge fees for their own planning activities. It also allows for provision to be made in the fees regulations for planning authorities to be able to waive or reduce a fee. I am grateful uh, to the Delegated Powers Committee for pointing out the discrepancy that the ability to waive or reduce fees did not apply to the Scottish Ministers, and Amendments 264 and 265 correct that oversight. Uh, Amendment 332 from John Finney uh, makes provision to charge fees for monitoring compliance of planning conditions. However, Scottish ministers already have the power to set such fees and regulations under the provisions of section 2521B uh, and have in fact exercised that power. Uh, the Town and uh, Country Planning Fees for Monitoring Surface Coal Mining Sites Scotland Regulations 2017 uh, provide for fees to be charged for site visits to monitor whether planning controls are being complied with. So I don't support the amendment because it is unnecessary. Uh, amendment 321 
uh, by Monica Lennon suggests some circumstances in which regulations might provide for fees to be waived, where the development would contribute to a social enterprise or non-profit organisation, or where the development is likely to contribute to improving the health of residents in the area to which the application relates. These are both areas I'd be happy to consider in the consultation, although we need to look carefully at the definitions. However, I would prefer to leave the options completely open until we have that consultation, um, so I don't support the amendment. Uh, Graham Simpson's Amendment 16 uh, would restrict ministers' powers to set out circumstances uh, in which a planning fee could be refunded for unreasonable delay. It would require ministers, if they use the power, those powers, to provide that the fee must be fully refunded if an application remains undecided after 26 weeks. The Scottish Government has maintained over many years that any increase in planning fees must be linked to improved performance. However, I do not think Mr Simpson's approach is the way to go about it. Uh, when we consulted on this option in 2010, less than a fifth of the respondents supported the proposal. Recent research has shown that there are many reasons for delays in deciding applications, and not all of those are within the control of an authority. In a large number of cases, the main reason for delay was waiting for additional reports or information from the applicant. I do not think introducing refunds as a matter of course would resolve these issues and lead to the improvement in timescales uh, that Mr Simpson might suppose. It certainly would not address the problem of under-resourcing facing planning authorities as they would be pr processing uh, an application without any payment. I am happy to include the question of when refunds might be appropriate within the forthcoming consultation on fees, but I do not believe this blanket approach is helpful. Um, I would ask the committee uh, to support the amendments in my name in this group and not to support the other amendments, and I move Amendment 259, convener. Thank you very much. Um, John Finney to speak to Amendment 332 and other amendments in the group. Thank you, uh, uh, convener. I will restrict my comments to the particular uh, amendment I have here, which is to introduce fees for monitoring complex developments. I, I hear what the Minister says in relation to that, and, and indeed uh, in, in my notes here I have about the surface coal mining. Um, but this is about extending that to other development types, because monitoring of complex developments is essential to ensure compliance, not simply with planning conditions, but particularly in relation to mitigation, restoration and aftercare plans. And indeed, there may be significant repercussions if such schemes are not appropriately monitored. So the proposals I have here are, would uh, allow for cost recovery for planning authority monitoring input and would accord, importantly, with the polluter praise principle. Is that you, John? Yes, indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Monica Lennon to speak to Amendment 321 and other amendments in the group. Uh, thank you. Um, convener, as the Minister has already mentioned, Amendment 321 in my name um, would waive fees and charges for development, which is the main purpose of contributing to a not-for-profit enterprise or contributes to improving the health of the residents in the area to which the development relates. Um, I've had some recent experience of charities in, in my region, in, in central Scotland, um, in particular a rape crisis centre, uh, who had to make a planning application to get a, a change of use uh, at their premises, and they had to pay the, the planning fee for that. And I think at a time when um, we've got, you know, in, in that particular case, a six-month waiting list for people to access um, rape um, survivor services. And I know the government stepped in with some, some additional money, but we still have these waiting times. It just seems that when we have these kinds of service and they're having to find money for planning applications, that we could do something um, about that. Um, also, in terms of the um, social enterprise um, part of it, what I've said here is that... Um, yeah, I mean, what, what I've got in mind is we've talked a lot in the past about bad neighbour developments. I'm trying to think about good neighbour developments. So what are the kinds of uses 
which would um, help to rescue our town centres, would have positive um, impacts on public health, tackling social isolation and loneliness. Um, but often for, for these kinds of organisations uh, or start-up businesses, the planning fees can indeed be a barrier. So that's the, the reason or the rationale behind the um, amendment, Minister. Um, I hear what the Minister has said, but I will press this today and hopefully I'll get some support from other members of the committee. Okay, thank you very much. Graham Simpson to speak to Amendment 16 and <coughs> other amendments. Um, <clears throat> thanks very much, Convener. Uh, the amendment would uh, ensure that if planning applications are not dealt with within 26 weeks, there should be a full fee refund unless agreed otherwise uh, between parties. Um, now, the intention behind it was to incentivise councils, but I've heard um, what the Minister has to say. I've heard what stakeholders uh, have to say, and indeed other members uh, that I've spoken to, and I'll not be pressing this particular amendment. Um, uh, and I do welcome the fact there's uh, going to be a consultation. Um, so turning to other amendments, uh, we can support the government amendments, 259 to 262, as well as uh, 264 and 265. Um, pleased that the ministers uh, responded to the DPLR committee there, and 266. Uh, we can also support Monica Lennon's amendment 321, uh, which uh, allows councils to waive fees for social enterprises. Uh, this could be a, a big incentive to get these uh, up and running. Intervention. Well, I've just finished. Uh, I'm supporting you. It's about 324. But, Feel free. Yeah. No, hopefully you'll find a, a helpful um, uh, intervention. I um, appreciate what you've just said. I'm, I'm grateful to that. Um, it was just to, to put on the record that in the previous um, vote on 324, I voted against Graeme Simpson's biodiversity effects um, um, amendment in error, I have to say, because yes. I got my notes muddled up. So uh, I do apologise for that. I'd like to put on record my support for the amendment. And if Graeme Simpson brings it back at stage three, I'd be happy to, to correct that. Thank you. That's, that's your friends again. Well, I've, I've, well I wouldn't go that far. I appreciate the comments. Um, this is, um, well, for the people watching, it can be a confusing experience, uh, uh, even for MSPs. So, um, um, you know, Monica made a mistake. We'll move on. Uh, yeah. Minister, would you like to wind up? Um, thank you, Convener. I'm glad that uh, the amendments that I've put forward seem to be relatively uncontroversial. Um, and I'm pleased that Mr Simpson has indicated that he won't uh, move uh, Amendment 16 because I do think that that was too pres prescriptive. Um, and if I was a, a developer, my ideal uh, timescale for my planning application to be approved would have been 27 weeks if that had uh, gone through. Um, I would ask uh, Ms Lennon um, to uh, look at not moving her amendment. I think that we can deal with all of these issues in the consultation. We can deal with all of these things in the round. I think that's the best place to do it, all in a winner, in the consultation. And I would ask her not to move, um, uh, but obviously I move the amendments in my name, convener. Uh, Ms Lennon would like to ask you. Uh, on, uh, yeah, fine. Um, yeah. Just on the consultation, forgive me, Minister, what's the time scale for the consultation? When would that end? Um, we've got to pass the bill first, so yeah. I, I'm unable to oh, so, yes, give you. I, I'm Sorry. unable to give you consultations uh -huh. uh, times until uh, we actually deal um, yeah, with the, with the bill. Yeah, apologies. I thought the minister was talking about a, an additional consultation that might be running in, in parallel. Well, I would I would be concerned about waiting that long. Okay, thank you. Yep. Uh, the question therefore is that Amendment Two Five Nine be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Amendments agreed. Call Amendment 260 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 259. Minister to move formally. Uh, moved, Convener. Okay. The question is that Amendment 260 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. yes. Agreed. Call Amendment 261 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 259. Minister to move formally. Moved, Convener. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 261 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The question therefore is that se Section 16 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? I call Amendment 15 in the name of Graham Simpson, grouped with Amendments 144, 22 and 142. Graham Simpson to move Amendment 15 and speak to all amendments in the group. Just bear with me. Thanks, Convener. Um, so I've lodged um, Amendment uh, 15 because I think it's imperative 
that there are limitations on the powers of Scottish ministers. Ministers shouldn't have the uninhibited ability to override and undermine local democracy through the ability to call in any application. Um, we also don't want to see ministers' authority undermined through their ability to be open to allegations of being influenced by third parties. I don't think that ministers should have carte blanche to call in any application. There must be checks on their power. Uh, my amendment would mean they could only call in national developments. Now, on reflection, convener, I think that's too strong. Um, it would have prevented, for example, uh, the call-in of the Cool Links application, uh, and I think it was right that the Minister uh, was able to call that in. So I won't move this, and I'll come back to it at stage three. I will, however, support Mark Ruskell's Amendment 22, um, which allows Ministers to make regulations around call-ins. Claudie Beamish's Amendment 142 says Ministers... Move it for the sake of the debate. Well, I'm not going to move it. Yeah, not for the sake of the debate. Right. You just don't press it. it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Right. Claudia Beamish's Amendment 142 says ministers must review applications where there is a flood risk. Uh, there would be applications which the uh, Scottish Environment Protection Agency has objected to on the grounds of concerns in relation to flood risk. I think it's possibly going too far. We have to trust councils, so the more proportionate word may uh, could, could have been better. Monica Lennon's Amendment 144 helps to prevent uh, the Scottish Government intervening in a planning application before a decision has been made. This will prevent ministers sweeping in too early uh, to impact how an ap application is decided. I'll be supporting that amendment. Thank you, convener. Thank you very much. Uh, Monica Lennon to speak to Amendment 144 and other amendments. Thank you, um, Convener. I'll begin by saying that I do accept that there are situations where I believe it is essential for ministers to have the power to call an application, so I wouldn't support plans to, to remove that, that power um, completely. But um, to pick up on where Graeme Simpson left off, um, I think there has to be a balance where when a planning application comes before the planning authority, there should be um, a reasonable period of time to allow the planning authority to do its normal business in terms of public consultation and to allow the neighbour notification period to take effect. Um, so just to, to clarify um, what, what Graeme Simpson said, it's not about um, having a situation where the planning authority has to make a decision uh, before ministers can intervene. It's about making sure that that period is protected. So under you know, regulations, um, planning authorities have to make a determination within a certain time period. It doesn't mean that that decision will be taken. Um, but I think when I've been looking at this, um, what I've been keeping in mind is what's happened in, in Kikenzi, where um, I believe that that application was called in prematurely very early on, I think around three, four weeks after the application was lodged. And I think that starts to um, get in the way of local accountability and the democratic rights of the local planning authority to properly scrutinise applications. Um, so I think it's only fair that local authorities are guaranteed the maximum amount of time set down in legislation to consider and properly scrutinise um, decisions. Thank you. Mark Ruskell to speak to Amendment 22 and other amendments in the group. Thanks, Convener. I'll, I'll be brief and move and speak to 22. Um, ministerial powers to uh, issue a direction to call in an application for determination are important. I think we can support those. Um, but there are also powers which, if they're used without transparency, uh, they can undermine faith and certainty in the planning system and, indeed, confidence uh, in the role of ministers within that. Um, so the purpose of this amendment is not to remove the availability of call-in powers or restrict it, but merely to allow government to bring clarity as to the circumstances whereby these could be used and then allow um, Parliament to scrutinise uh, these regulations under the affirmative procedure. Thank you very much. Uh, Claudia Beamish to speak to Amendment 142 and other amendments in the group. Thank you, Convener. Um, I do not intend to um, move um, Amendment 142 today. Uh, there has been robust and useful discussion, in my view, on, um, the, on flood risk in relation to my Amendment 140, and there are uh, ways in which these issues can be taken forward, and as this is a consequential amendment, I, I will say no more about it. 
Thank you very much. Uh, Minister. Thank you, Convener. Uh, Scottish Minister's discretion to call in any planning application uh, from a planning authority for their own determination is a well-established and important aspect of our planning system. Uh, it has been exercised over the decades by successive governments uh, to call in a wide range of applications across Scotland. Uh, this government does, however, uh, recognise planning as a, a primarily uh, a matter for local authorities uh, and values their key, very key role in the system. In 2009, uh, we announced a, a more proportionate approach uh, to ministerial intervention in planning cases. Uh, we greatly reduced the circumstances uh, in which planning authorities had to notify applications to ministers to consider calling and made it clear that we would exercise our right to call in applications very sparingly and only where matters of genuine national interest were involved. Uh, that has been borne out in our actions. Applications notified to ministers uh, dropped from around 200 uh, cases each year before 2009 to an average of 24 now. Uh, and the number of planning applications called in has dropped from around 25 to 30 annually to just three to five each year now. Uh, for a bit of context, over 35,000 applications were decided across Scotland last year. Uh, I will do. Uh, thank the Minister for taking intervention. Um, does he appreciate that the, um, I think those policy, uh, the, 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 those moves by the, the current administration, I think are personally welcome, but this is about the law and what the law says about the level of discretion, and there's nothing to stop a future administration operating their discretion far more liberally than the current administration. So it is, a, it is about providing greater clarity and certainty and fettering the discretion to a degree um, of ministers to use this power. I'll talk further about discretion and, and come to some of the points about the law, because some of this is not as easy as, as members um, may think. Um, I respect the um, role that is played by our planning authorities, but circumstances can occasionally arise where it is more appropriate uh, to further scrutinise and decide an application at the national level. Um, I'm regularly asked by members of this parliament, uh, including members of the committee and visitors to the committee here today, uh, to call in applications all over Scotland. Uh, sometimes it's appropriate for me to do so, uh, but in many cases, uh, people have been disappointed where I have uh, chosen not uh, to call in um, uh, applications. I do not intervene where I consider it appropriate for the planning authority to make the decision. Um, as a very current example, uh, and it was touched upon by Mr Simpson, I recently called in a planning application um, from the Highland Council for a new golf course at Cool near Embo. Um, it's a live case uh, and I will have to make the final decision. So obviously I'm not gonna make any comments about the merits uh, of the uh, case itself. But I had received requests to call in that application from 14 MSPs uh, across parties, uh, one MP, uh, and also from bodies such as RSPB Scotland, uh, the National Trust uh, for Scotland, the Scottish Wildlife Trust and the Marine Conservation Society. Uh, we also received uh, a great number of uh, letters of concern uh, and some of support um, from the public. Ultimately, um, I uh, uh, considered it was appropriate uh, to call in that application for a decision at a national level uh, because the proposal raises issues of national importance, importance in relation to natural heritage issues and its compliance with Scottish planning policy. Uh, I'm glad that Mr Simpson is not moving Amendment 15 because if that had been passed, I would not have been able to do that um, as it is not a national development within the national planning framework. However, it is not only national developments 
that can uh, raise issues of national importance. Even small developments can have a significant impact on our natural and historic environment or important in in infrastructure. And those are just uh, a, a few examples. Um, there are circumstances where planning decisions ought to be made nationally, and many people would, n would not want to see that power of additional scrutiny lost. Amendment 22 um, lodged by Mark Ruskell in itself recognises that there are circumstances where planning decisions ought to be made nationally and that therefore sometimes ministerial call-in can be appropriate. And I welcome that sentiment. I also understand uh, the, the, the sentiment behind this amendment to bring more certainty to how and when call-in is exercised. However, I don't think that we can reasonably set out in legislation an exhaustive set of circumstances under which applications may or may not be subject to call-in. While this amendment uh, would not remove Scottish Minister's discretion entirely, it could raise expectations and become unduly restrictive. Earlier this year, convener, um, I issued a notification direction for an application <coughs> for proposed residential development on a site next to Edinburgh Zoo. My decision to intervene uh, was in light of possible negative health impacts uh, for the giant pandas, as advised in representations uh, by the Royal Zoological Society of Scotland. The issues raised are of national and arguably of international importance, uh, but it seems unlikely that any regulations would have covered the conditions required uh, to take cognizance of panda love and romance. Uh, and this shows the value of a responsive approach. I do, however, recognise it may be helpful to bring more clarity to the government's approach uh, to Colin. And I, I'm prepared to look again at our guidance to see, seek to bring greater clarity to the approach this government takes in considering Colin. Uh, for the, these reasons, and with this commitment, I would ask Mr Ruskell uh, to withdraw this amendment. Amendment 144, in the name of Monica Lennon, uh, would prevent a call-in direction being issued until after the period prescribed for the planning authority to issue a decision notice has expired. However, once a decision notice has been issued, there is, and there is no live application to determine, the Scottish ministers cannot call in the case unless the applicant seeks a local review of the decision. I'll Points. take an intervention from Ms Slenna. Thank you, uh, Minister. Um, I, I've taken some advice from the, the Parliament clerks on this uh, because other members had asked me the, the same question and the, the amendment is not designed um, to require the planning authority to have made the decision, because I, I get the minister's point about the minister then would effectively not be able to, to call it in, but it's to allow that, that time period to pass. So we're talking about that, that two month period, um, because the earlier example I gave about Kokenzie, um, the call in um, direction came very early in the process. And I, and I think to go back to my earlier remarks, um, I think it's right that there has to be um, a call-in process. I think we need those checks and balances and it has to be proportionate. But the, the example that the Minister gave in terms of cool links, the, the local process uh, was able to kind of run its course and we were able to then see that this indeed was a, a case of, of national and, and actually international significance. But we can see that body of, of evidence, that body of representation. I think it's very healthy that, that many uh, MSPs and uh, members did make representations. So this is about not trying to bypass uh, local democracy. Um, so I just wanted to, to make that, that point clear to the Minister. And if I can squeeze in a question to the Minister, um, I, I wonder about those sort of three to five um, call-in um, cases that you're looking at um, sort of annually. 
do you routinely visit those sites? Um, I just wondered if, if that's part of your assessment. Do you visit all of those sites? Um, convener, we once uh, again have a situation where a member is trying to say that their amendment doesn't do a certain thing, when quite categorically it does. Um, and this is one of the things about the unintended consequences of certain amendments that have been lodged. Um, and, you know, I have uh, spoken uh, with a number of members around about amendments and I, 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 it's led to um, better drafting. Um, and not all of those amendments do I agree with necessarily. Um, Ms Lennon has had the opportunity uh, to come and speak to me about a number of these amendments and a meeting was arranged but uh, that was cancelled um, by Ms Lennon. I would say again to members that I'm more than willing to speak to anybody around about their amendments uh, and I'm willing to have my officials speak to members about their amendments. But what I cannot do, convener, is sit here um, and have a situation where a member has put forward amend an amendment but says that the amendment is not designed to do that when the <coughs> amendment quite clearly does that thing. Um, convener... Uh, I'll take a brief intervention from Ms Ewing, yes. Thank you, Minister. I, I just, uh, in the interest of clarity, having been on both sides of the table, I, I hear sort of muttering at this end of the table that they feel that their position is absolutely, that's the advice they've been given. Could the Minister perhaps therefore clarify why the Minister takes the view uh, that he does? Presumably this is uh, advice from uh, officials that this, his interpretation that he is putting forward of the consequences, perhaps unintended, of Monica Lennon's amendment are nonetheless, as he says, further to the advice that he has uh, received. Um, convener, I have got, um, as uh, folk could well imagine, a number of officials working on this bill, including um, uh, legal uh, so lawyers, solicitors, looking uh, at all of these and the consequences. Now, convener, I've been um, quite open in terms of uh, giving um, the committee purpose and effect documents to try and show exactly what the purpose and effect of amendments are. Um, I cannot do that for um, folks' individual uh, 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 amendments. But I, 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 can, can I just finish this point, Mr Finney, and then I'll take you in. Um, I'm, I, I'm more than happy, as I've said, and a number of uh, members have taken advantage of either meeting with me to talk about purpose and effect or meeting with officials. Uh, to talk about the effects of, of their amendments. And some amendments, uh, we've seen one today um, with uh, Mr um, Balfour, um, where you know uh, the work that has been done there has led to an amendment which is much, much better um, for all concerned, uh, including uh, Mr uh, uh, Balfour and uh, the folk out there um, who are interested in this issue. I'll, I'll take Mr Finney, um, convener. I'm grateful for the Minister taking the intervention, Convener, and um, certainly on other committees, I, I've appreciated the Scottish Government sharing the purpose and effect. I wonder would the Minister, though, accept that some things are actually a matter of opinion. Um, everyone's here acting in good faith. We've all come with uh, pieces of proposed change that have been certified as competent. But what doesn't sometimes come out in that, uh, in some of the discussions, is the purpose and effect of not doing some. Um, I uh, agree with Mr Finney in, in some regards in that point and you know those are the kind of discussions uh, that could uh, happen if uh, these uh, discussions were taking place. I welcome uh, members coming to speak to me um, about uh, this bill. Um, I think that a number of, mem of members around the table um, have had uh, numerous meetings with me. Uh, a number of um, members around the table have chose not to meet with me, and that's their prerogative, but uh, have, um, have spoken to officials um, around about this. I'm quite happy for that, Convener, because, you know, no matter what, what, I want the best piece of legislation um, that is possible. Um, and Mr Finney is right. Often there are different opinions, but the legal uh, advice that I get, you know, I have to, to look at very, very carefully uh, indeed, as he could well understand. Um, convener, if I could carry on um, with uh, this particular thing, I, 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 as I said, uh, once a decision has been issued um, and there is no live application to determine, Scottish ministers cannot 
call in the case, unless, of course, the applicant seeks a local review of the decision. In the normal course of events, um, we would only consider issuing a call in direction uh, where the planning authority had processed an application and was intending to grant permission. And that triggered a requirement to notify ministers of their intention. There are general notification directions which apply to cases where, for example, an agency or neighbouring planning authority has advised against a grant of planning permission or planning authority interest cases that are contrary to the development plan. Intervening early in the planning process is extremely rare. However, there have been and may be again instances where early intervention by ministers is considered necessary in the national interest. Uh, for example, to make sure that a decision is made before other deadlines expire. Uh, and that was the case in Kikenzi. Uh, it would not be helpful to lose that ability. Amendment 142, um, again, Ms uh, Beamish has said that she's withdrawing, and I'm grateful for that, um, uh, again, would put SEPA at the forefront of uh, decision-making, which I don't think is uh, the right thing. Um, and I, I, I'm very grateful uh, to Ms Beamish for the conversations that she has had, comprehensive conversations that she's had with officials uh, around about this. And I've given commitment to look at these matters in, in some more depth, uh, as she is well aware. Um, I would very strongly urge the committee um, not to support the amendments in this group. Thank you. Sorry, have you, did you ask for intervention? Yeah, I'm intervention on that, yeah, Premier. No. I, I'm happy if you are, Convener. Sorry, Alexander, you're too late. Okay, that's fine. That's okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, Graham Simpson to wind up. And press um, or withdraw. Yeah, thank, thank, thanks very much. Um, uh, well, I'll, 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 not be pre I'll not be pressing this, as I said uh, earlier, but uh, I think it's certainly raised um, a very uh, important issue, and that is the issue of uh, how much power should be divested in the minister. Um, uh, an interve uh, intervention at that point, convener. Certainly. Um, yeah. I, I, I think, you know, Mr Simpson raises a point about where power lies. Um, and, you know, there's always debate around about that. Can I say that some of the amendments uh, that have been put forward in this bill actually were to give ministers more power? Um, than they currently have in a number of issues. And I think that that is always, um, a, 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 there's always a, a fine balance to, to certain of these things. I think that I understand completely and utterly um, that people uh, want uh, some clarity on a number of issues. But I think designating in primary legislation some of these things makes life extremely difficult. Again, there are unintended consequences. I am more than ha happy to have further discussion with Mr. Ruskell, um, and I think that's right to do so. But I would ask you not to support his amendment today. Who is either making an intervention or responding to an intervention to be as short as he can be. Interventions are meant to be brief, uh, and if people are going to make interventions that are lengthy, then they're not likely to get a future one. Uh, thank you, Minister. Uh, Graham, sorry. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm not quite sure why the Minister felt the need to make that intervention. He's just repeated himself. Uh, and given that I've uh, said that I'm not going to be moving uh, Amendment 15, um, it was slightly unnecessary. Um, th this, this is about uh, ministerial power only on call-ins. That's what we're dealing with here. Um, when is it right to call in an application? Now, this Minister may, may not call in very many. Well, good for him. He's not going to be the minister forever. Uh, this government may not be a government forever, but we have to um, deal with the law as it stands. Um, so you could have uh, another minister in future who takes an entirely different approach. So it's quite right that we set out the boundaries of what ministerial powers uh, should be. Um, I said earlier, I think my amendment 15 goes too far. Um, it does. Um, Mr. Ruskell's 
uh, is way, way at the other end of that scale, giving ministers uh, the ability to set their own regulations. And I cannot see why uh, the minister would uh, oppose that. Um, you wish to come in? Uh, there's a couple of interventions which I'm happy to take. Convener, and, and would you ag agree with me, Mr Simpson, that the, the minister has almost already accepted the notion of creating a framework and, and guidance uh, around ministerial call and decisions. He just doesn't want to see it in affirmative regulation, which I think is disappointing. Um, I would entirely agree with that. Miss Lennon wants in. Okay. Briefly, um, I just want to reflect on the fact that I think where people have been afforded the opportunity to meet with the minister um, and or his officials, that that has been productive. But um, I was quite disappointed with the minister's remarks that I cancelled a meeting and, in effect, didn't bother to pursue that. No, I have to put this on the record. I have to put this on the record because um, I that's, was offered a date, if, if I can finish briefly. Well, um, actually, I was offered a date. Uh, as, as convener, I decide yeah. if you can finish. You, you can... You can write to the minister if you're unhappy with these comments. You can put it in public record after well, that. Well, I think the let's, minister let's has been very unfair and misleading, the but of the we've day. got the email chain to, to prove that, yes, and I will write to the minister. But nothing to do I would be tonight. more than happy to have dialogue and have a meeting with the minister. Excuse me, Monica. And his officials. See when I say it's finished. It's finished. Thank you. Uh, right, Graham, you're finished. Are you going to press on the floor? Thank you, uh, convener. I'll not be uh, pressing this. Thank you. Right. Uh, Graham Simpson wishes to withdraw their amendment. Does any member present object to this amendment being withdrawn? Thank you. I call Amendment 144 in the name of Monica Lennon. Already debated with Amendment 1A15. Monica Lennon to move or not move? Move. The question is that Amendment 144 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Those in favour of the amendment? Three. Those opposed? Three and one abstention. Therefore, the, the convener's casting vote means that the amendment falls. I call Amendment 22 in the name of Mark Ruskell, already debated with Amendment 15. Mark Ruskell to move or not move? Moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 22 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Those in favour of 22? It's four. Those against? Three. The amendment's passed. I call Amendment 142 in the name of Claudia Beamish, already debated with Amendment 15. Claudia Beamish, to move or not move? Not move. Please. Thank you. I call Amendment 164 in the name of John Finney, in a group of its own. John <coughs> Finney, to move and speak to Amendment 164. Thank you very much, uh, Convener. And uh, firstly, can I say I, I would like to thank the, the Minister for the offer of talks in relation to this. The, the, this particular issue, uh, unfortunately, diary clashes meant that, that uh, that's not been able to take place. But I, I'm, as with other previous amendments, I, I, I'd be very keen to continue discussions. <clears throat> this is my second term in Parliament. And in the last term, uh, I was on the Equal Opportunities Committee, which uh, produced two very strongly worded reports on a cross-party consensual basis. And they were about the conditions that Gypsy traveller community have to put up with, um, both in relation to accommodation and health conditions. Um, I don't doubt people's commitment, and there are people since that uh, the, the Cabinet Secretary, Angela Constance, for instance, I know was steering. I know the Minister himself is involved with various aspects. So this particular amendment covers the issue of uh, uh, permitted development, and uh, I, yeah, I suppose we could argue we've already had that passed today with Mr Balfour's amendment. Um, importantly, that would only be considered where it's in accordance with the development plan. Um, and uh, some examples that in fairly recent times there's been permitted development rights for alterations to shops, schools, colleges, universities, hospital, office buildings, off-street recharging of electric vehicles with disabled access ramps, and uh, one that's specifically applied to private ways, commonly known as tracks or whole tracks, which I know the committee will go on to discuss. So. Um, We'd have to ask what's come of, of these reports um, and the, I, I suppose the argument to what extent uh, it relates to this legislation. Uh, it, it's certainly my personal belief that there's a willingness both centrally and locally to do, ish, do things, but there is that tension that we've heard in relation to a number of other amendments between central direction over local autonomy. Um, there's no doubt that sites struggle to gain permission. Uh, that's often down to local pressure and it's fuelled by prejudice. Um, 
some of the language, and, and I welcome a recent debate that we had on a, a change in language away from housing and it being viewed as housing to being viewed as accommodation. And for instance, in, in fairly recent weeks, I've dealt with a, a situation where someone was shut out their accommodation. This was a centuries old location where um, travellers were unable to go because a, a farmer had dug a tent trench around the site. And I stress this particular group of travellers for centuries. Um, and um, Now, the language of the day, of course, is that that would be an unauthorised encampment, and it begs the question how authorised provision is, is afforded. As I say, I acknowledge all the efforts, um, and if I sound a bit frustrated, it is because I'm extremely frustrated at, at dealing with this and the disregard that there is for this uh, community. And, and there's barely a week goes past that there isn't examples, and there was fun, one fairly recently in this very city here. So this may seem a very blunt instrument. I make no apology for it being a blunt instrument, and I move this uh, amendment in my name, Convener. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Uh, Minister. Thank you, Convener, um, and I applaud Mr Finney. Um, as members know, um, he has been very active uh, on the issues of rights for the gy gypsy traveller community. Uh, and he raises an important issue around the accommodation needs of the gypsy traveller community. Um, and as I've explained to the committee previously, I'm absolutely committed to ensuring uh, that gypsy travellers are properly involved in planning the future of their places. Uh, the quality of our places matters to all of us. Uh, and planning has a responsibility uh, to ensure the needs of all of our communities are understood and met. Uh, to do this, uh, we are determined to break down the barriers, any barriers, that stop people getting involved in shaping the future of their places. Uh, the committee accepted amendments uh, to part one of the bill uh, that will ensure that community voices are heard when a pl planning uh, authority is preparing a local development plan. And whilst I'm entirely supportive of Mr Finney's motive and intentions, I'm unable to support this particular approach. Uh, this amendment would work against a key principle of our planning system of decisions being made by planning authorities in accordance with the current development plan, unless material considerations uh, would indicate otherwise. Uh, planning does play a vital role uh, in ensuring that gypsy travellers have safe and secure places to stop or settle. Currently, uh, Scottish planning policy requires councils to plan for the current and future needs of the gypsy traveller community um, and involve the community in planning and decision making which affects them. It states that development plans and local housing strategies should address any need identified through the housing needs and demand assessment, including those of, uh, of gypsy travellers. Uh, we refreshed the HNDA guidance in October this year, uh, and the most significant change to the refreshed guidance is the inclusion of an enhanced requirement for local authorities to consult with stakeholders in relation to specialist provision uh, for accommodation and housing for all groups with protected characteristics, including the gypsy traveller community. So local development plans should make appropriate provision for gypsy traveller sites, and where an application is in line with that plan, it should usually be agreed. But planning authorities must have the flexibility uh, to make sure the detailed proposals for the site are suitable, listening to the people involved, and to refuse the application if not. Otherwise, we could end up uh, with sites that don't actually meet the needs of the community and end up unused, and that in itself does not help anyone. Earlier this year, convener, um, the government put together a 10-point action plan uh, on gypsy travellers and planning, uh, and we are moving forward to deliver it as I speak. Uh, I would be happy to provide the committee uh, with a copy of it, if that is of interest. Uh, as part of this, 
we have commissioned research to find out more about how the planning system currently addresses the need and demand for gypsy traveller sites. The results of the research will inform the preparation of the next national planning framework. And we are also actively drawing attention to this issue with heads of planning and planning committee conveners. I want to make sure that the gypsy traveller community has a stronger voice in guiding the future development of their places and that appropriate provision is made for them. But I don't believe we should do so by an approach which bypasses local decision ma making. Uh, I am more than happy uh, to have further discussions with Mr Finney, as he uh, has already said, but I would ask him uh, not to move his amendment here today. Thank you, Convener. Thank you, Minister. Uh, John Finney to wind up, please. Uh, thank you, Convener. I, I thank the, the Minister for his uh, remarks. And the, the term further was because we have had passing, literally passing in the corridor, very brief discussions. What, what I would say is, uh, I mean, l l let's, if we analyse some of the things the, the Minister said there, he talked about the housing strategy, and that's a very important document, except that gypsies and travellers don't consider housing as an appropriate term. The housing needs um, is very important. The Minister went on to say how we address the needs and demands. Well, I mean, I can think of a local authority where following um, some vandalism on a site without consulta consulting with anyone, they decided that there was no need. I asked how you assess the demand. How do you assess the demand across authorities? We are dealing with a population which by its very nature travels. So it's not for one authority. Now, um, and I apologize to people who have heard me on our rant about this previously, my particular frustration isn't with the local authorities for whom who provide but there's a whole load of authorities that have got their heads down and want nothing to do with this. So the idea <clears throat> that we would leave this to local flexibility, that means inertia. And what I would ask is, in, in relation to planning for current and future needs, what has happened? Nothing has happened. Absolutely zero. Does any of that reinstate that, that traditional site? I was over in Skye. People have relocated from one lay-by to another. People will know that as a, a, a result of what were the so-called New Age travellers, um, many of whom are comedians now back working as merchant bankers in the city of London. Lots of areas were cut off. Traditional stopping sites were dug up. And we've, we've, I've, I've repeatedly raised this and I've been told nonsense like there's health and safety issues. There's no health and safety issue at all. People make decisions on their own merits. And the individuals who dug a trench and put boulders can get the JCB back, fill in the trench and remove the boulders. It requires action by government. Everyone is well-meaning. I don't doubt for one second the will of the minister and his colleagues to address something. But unless someone's going to grasp it and say, and of course, as a Green, I absolutely value local decision-making. But there is no decision-making. There is no decision-making because you know that the local paper will have a, a, a protest. Local members will um, follow the views of their community. And it's very, very, there's, there's considerable difficulties in ministers' own part of the world that have been well-documented difficulties. So um, I don't know, if the minister explained to me how the strategy has helped in the last five years, how the housing needs analysis, even the terminology. Um, if Mr Finney lets me intervene, um, you know, <clears throat> I've already spelled out some of the actions that we have and we are going to take. Um, I don't want to go into a huge amount of depth here today around about that. I am more than willing to have that in-depth conversation uh, with Mr Finney about how we move forward <coughs> on this and other issues. I think Mr Finney knows um, that I have shared his frustration uh, around about some of these issues um, for uh, quite some time, um, and in particular um, where I was a local authority member um, myself. Um, I will work with Mr Finney uh, to try and ensure that we can better uh, the lives of gypsy travellers and involve them more in the process. But I do I have to reiterate that I don't think that this is the way of doing it by bypassing local decision making. But I'm, I'm more than willing to talk further with Mr Finney. Um, thank you, Commissioner. I, I, I thank the Minister for that intervention. And, and of course, I'll say again, for the avoidance of any doubt, I don't doubt his personal commitment to this. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I think we'll just make the diaries work and add that to the list of agenda, and I won't press this 
Yeah, I mean, at this time, thank you. Continue. Thank you very much. Uh, John Finney wishes to withdraw his amendment. Does any member present object to this amendment being withdrawn? No. The amendment, therefore, is withdrawn. I call Amendment 165 in the name of Andy Whiteman and a group on its own. Andy Whiteman to move and speak to Amendment 165. Uh, thank you very much indeed, uh, Convener. I move Amendment 165 in my name. This amendment deals with a, a long-running issue in planning, that of private ways. Essentially, tracks built on land for private purposes, but especially at high altitudes in the hills uh, and the lack of effective planning uh, control. Tracks constructed for the purpose of agriculture and forestry do not currently require full planning consent. They are a permitted development. Tracks built for the purpose of field sports and shooting are, in theory, required to be subject to full planning consent, but all too often are not, for reasons I will explain shortly. In 2013, Scottish Environment Link published a major report called Track Changes, highlighting the widespread damage being done across Scotland's hills by poorly constructed tracks. Despite widespread support for such development to be brought under full planning control at that time, and, as I understand it, clear advice from officials to Scottish ministers. The then minister, Derek Mackay, instead introduced a system of prior notification as part of the continuing regime of permitted development rights. Last month, uh, Scottish Environment Link uh, published a follow-up report, uh, Changing Tracks, which I understand is in the possession of members of this committee, the minister and officials, that evaluates experience since 2014. Its conclusions include that the system is confusing, lacks democratic oversight and effective public engagement, and that the current system continues to allow damaging development. And I commend Link and the author of this excellent report, Melanie uh, Nicholl, for all their hard work. I mentioned two reasons why the theoretical requirement for full consent for tracks used for the purpose of field sports is failing. Uh, and these are, firstly, it is not universally agreed that field sports are a distinct purpose from agriculture and the legislation creating permitted development rights did not adequately define agriculture and forestry. Secondly, and this is the important one, in numerous instances, applicants are claiming that a track is for agricultural purposes, when in fact it's for grouse shooting or deer stalking, and they make that argument on the basis that there might be a few sheep grazing on the hill. It is virtually impossible for planning authorities to challenge or disprove such claims, and if they attempt to, they're likely to end up in the court of session. There's an important point to be made about Amendment 165. The first part of this amendment merely restates the current law as it is supposed to operate. I would ideally be bringing forward an amendment that removed permitted development rights for agriculture and forestry as well. I've chosen not to on the basis that, for proportionality reasons, the major impacts that are occurring are in areas used for shootings where tracks are being built very, very often being claimed to be for agriculture. The major impacts are not coming from farming and they're not coming from forestry, albeit that I do believe they should come under full planning consent. That is not the purpose of this uh, amendment. Now, the second part of the amendment uh, is new. It extends the current regime whereby full planning consent for private ways in national scenic areas are required. It extends that regime to cover national parks, a designation under the Nature Conservation Scotland Act 2004, uh, and battlefields. Now, the Cairngorm National Park Authority's latest park plan, which was signed off by Rosanna Cunningham, the Cabinet Secretary, contains a presumption against new constructed tracks in open moorland. The problem is that the authority can only implement this presumption in the 25% of the national park area that is a national scenic area where full planning consent is required. Over the rest of the park, 75% of its extent, applications for such tracks are permitted development subject to a prior notification regime introduced in 2014. And over that 75%, the principle of tracks has already been conceded through the prior development permitted development regime and effectively granted by them, qualifying for permitted development rights notwithstanding that prior approval can assist in modifying some elements of design uh, or routing. So my amendment does two things. First, it requires tracks on land used for shooting in field sports, not on tracks used for that purpose, because that's been the reason for the loophole, but it requires tracks on land used for shooting in field sports to be subject to full planning consent. As I said earlier, technically this is already the case, but as I indicated, uh, this is being widely flouted 
by claiming that they're for agricultural purposes merely because there's a few sheep in the hill that are actually not for agricultural purposes at all. They're there to mop up ticks to try and boost populations of grouse. Now, I am not singling out, in the words of Scottish Land and Estates, briefing or demonising a vital industry. I'm focusing on the circumstances where most issues and problems are occurring. And if members are concerned that I'm picking on shooting and field sports, I'd be happy not to do so and come back with an amendment that also includes agriculture and forestry and treat everyone equally. The second thing it does is to require that the current... Intervention yep. I mean, I hear what the member has just said just one second ago, but I mean, do you want, does the member want to um, impinge on the activities of agriculture and forestry? I would have thought that agriculture and forestry is actually a good thing. Well, I, I haven't said anything to suggest that they're not. Of course, they're a good thing. Lots of things are good things. The planning system is there uh, to make sure that developments are done uh, with, with proper regard to uh, local development plans, uh, the environment and all the rest of it. And there are many agriculture and forestry tracks that don't. Uh, but I'm leaving them out at the moment for proportionality reasons. So the second thing the amendment does is to require that the current provisions that require full planning consent for any private way in a national scenic area be extended to national parks designations under the Nature Conservation Act 2004 and battlefields. Such an extension to national parks and other protected landscapes was recommended in a government commissioned review in 2007. My amendment does not even go as far as that review recommended because, as I indicated, it leaves the PDR regime for agriculture and forestry untouched. It is totally acceptable in my view, unacceptable in my view, that ordinary householders are required to secure full planning consents for many quite modest developments, but miles and miles of poorly constructed roads in Scotland's national parks in particular can be built with no equivalent level of scrutiny and public consultation. If this amendment is not passed, then there will be continuing damage done to the natural heritage through the inability of planning authorities to effectively regulate the construction of hill tracks. Nothing in my amendment is banning hill tracks. Uh, it is merely providing planning authorities with the routine procedures that they have in place already governing a wide range of other developments of which hill tracks should also be included. Thank you, convener. Thank you. Uh, Graham, you wanted to come in? Yeah, th thanks a lot, convener. Um, you know, I, I really value the, the countryside. Uh, I think most committee, well, probably all com committee members, value the countryside. Um, I've met with Ramblers Scotland. I've I've read the report changing tracks. It makes, it does make a compelling case for for better regulation. I have to say that. Um, but the current system has only been with us since December 2014. It does seem a little bit early to be changing legislation. Now, the problem I have with uh, Andy Whiteman's uh, amendment uh, is that it, it, it does single out land that is used for shooting and field sports. That's, those are the words in, in the amendment. Take an intervention? Yes. Would the member in those circumstances therefore be willing to not single them out and instead include agriculture and forestry and remove them from permitted development rights? Well, the, pro the problem is, Mr Whiteman, we're dealing with the amendment in front of us, and it does single out uh, land used for shooting and field sports. If Andy Whiteman wants to bring in another amendment for stage three, we can consider it. Um, but I think um, that, that as it stands, it, it, goes too, it goes too far, and I can't support it on that basis. I do, I do. Uh, well, just let, let me continue. I accept there is an issue there is an issue out there. Uh, I'm a keen hill walker. Anyone who goes out into the hills can see it for themselves. There is an issue, but I think this amendment goes too far. I'll take the intervention. Do, does the, thank you for taking the intervention. Well, does the member agree with me that as the law currently stands, tracks built for the purpose of field sports do require full planning consent, but that they are not, full planning consent is not being asked for because these applications are coming in masquerading as agriculture. Therefore, this amendment does little more than restate the current law in more, in, in more effective terms. Does the member not agree? I have no idea if that's the case, Mr. Wine. I don't know what. I've had no evidence uh, to suggest that. Um, I, I do have a suggestion, though, uh, because the minister is going to speak afterwards. And I think if the minister was to c commit to reviewing how the current legislation is working, 
and promise to issue guidance to councils if it's not working as it should, then that would be very helpful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Minister. Beener, can I first of all say that there are no current permitted development rights for shooting or field sports. If a planning authority is not satisfied on prior notification that a private way is for agriculture or forestry use, they should require a planning application for it. Very, very briefly. That, that, that is exactly the position as I set out. And does the Minister agree, however, that for a planning authority to refuse such an application on the basis that they believe that the purpose of the track is for field sports, it's very, very difficult to make that case when tomorrow there might be a mountain rescue team using the track, when the next day there might be a shepherd going up to doze some sheep with insecticide. It is virtually impossible for planning authorities to make that case and use the law as it is intended. Um, I think, again, you know, it is what actually is the outcome of an amendment. Um, and, you know, there's debate uh, around about that. Um, convener, let me turn to um, the key issue around about permitted development rights. Um, they're set out uh, in the Town and Country Planning General Permitted Development Scotland Order 1992 as amended over the years and are commonly referred to as the GPDO, and I'll refer to them as such from there, here on in. Um, development rights are intended in part to strike uh, a balance between the needs of businesses uh, to have a degree of certainty that they can carry out any necessary development required for the operation of the business, while balancing this against other factors such as the impact on the environment, local amenity uh, and so on. Um, I understand that there are concerns around the creation of private ways and their potential uh, for negative impact on visual amenity and the environment. And the government sought to address that in 2014 uh, when we introduced a requirement for any agricultural and forestry private ways to be notified to planning authorities and the design, layout and method of construction agreed by them. However, uh, we must also consider the needs of farmers and foresters who need access to their lands for their regular operations, including planting and harvesting and reaching remote grazing areas. National parks, national scenic areas and triple SIs cover something like 20% of Scotland. And these areas are not empty landscapes. Removing permitted development rights in all of that land would impact on significant numbers of businesses. For that reason, I believe the place to consider amending permitted development rights is through the GPDO after a proper con consultation that gives all parties the chance to have their views heard. Uh, the Scottish Government is committed to a review of the GPDO following the completion of the Planning Bill, and we will consider calls for changes to permitted development for private ways alongside other proposals for change, and any proposed changes will be subject to a full public consultation. Uh, and with that um, uh, assurance to Mr Simpson that we will review these, I would uh, call upon the committee uh, to reject the amendment. OK, thank you. Andy, to wind up. I think I welcome the Minister's uh, restatement that the permitted development rights are, are to be reviewed, and I will certainly be making representations in that regard uh, on agriculture and forestry. But agriculture and forestry are, are, not, are not the subject of this amendment. The subject of this amendment is uh, tracks that are built for field sports and, sh and, and shooting, which are uh, where applicants are widely flouting the intention of the current legislative regime, whereby that they are lying, essentially, to planning authorities, saying that these tracks are for agricultural purposes. And one very, very good example that caused a lot of controversy uh, two or three years ago uh, was on the Leadgowan estate near Achnesheen in Wester Ross. The applicant said that this was for agricultural purposes. Highland Council accepted that. Highland Council was in no position to be able to refute that 
because there were agricultural activities taking place on that estate. The evidence, however, that this was, if I just finish my point, the evidence, however, that this was a masquerading came a couple of years later when the estate was put on the market with a very, very ugly and unsightly track built, where in the sales particulars, and this is an attempt to get more money um, for the sale of the estate, and I quote, accessibility to the majority of the hill ground has been transformed by the construction of a network of hill roads. This significantly expands the scope of the stocking to enable those of all levels of physical fitness, etc. Now, this is typical, absolutely typical, of the circumstances in which these tracks are being built all over Scotland. And I would just remind the Minister that the intention of this amendment is to restate the current law, which, as the Minister pointed out, requires full planning consent in a way that is more effective and actually delivers the policy intent. I'll take the Minister. Thank you. Um, I understand what Mr Whiteman is trying to do in, in terms of restating the current law, but his amendment is not worded in that way. And this is the difficulty in all of this, because his amendment says, consists of the formation or alteration of a private way on land which is used for shooting or other field sports. Now, there is land which is used for a number of different mm -hmm. things, including agriculture and shooting and field sports, forestry and shooting and field sports. Mm -hmm. And this is the problem with your amendment because what you're doing here is not just restating what is currently the situation. You're going beyond that. The wording of the amendment is not right, which causes difficulty. Uh, and, you know, I am willing to look at all of this in a review of gen general permitted development rights. But once again, we have an amendment with unintended consequences. I accept what the Minister is saying. It's impossible to restate the law exactly as it is, otherwise there would be no point in an amendment. This does change the focus from the purpose of a track to the land on which the track is constructed. And I accept, as in the case I've just decided, there are different uses going on. And what this, acts as is, is, uh, uh, what this does is act as a filter that where shooting or field sports are taking place, and we can modify this language a bit, where they're taking place, for the avoidance of doubt, that requires full planning consent. And that would overcome the current um, regime whereby this pr provision whereby uh, tracks are required to have planning consent is being uh, widely uh, flouted. Um, I have nothing more to add. I've made the arguments for it, and I invite members to support Amendment 165. Thank you very much. Uh, the question there for us, that Amendment 165, be agreed to? Are we all agreed? Yes. Those in favour of 165? Two. Those opposed? Five. The amendment therefore falls. I call amendment 316. This is going to be the last section. Would, okay. would that be okay? Right. Fine. Yeah. That's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, which I was just about to say, actually. Uh, call amendment 316 in the name of Patrick Harvey in a group on its own. And Patrick Harvey to move and speak to amendment 316. Other members? Right. Okay. Thank you very much, convener, and good afternoon, colleagues. Uh, I, I hope uh, this uh, won't take uh, too long. One of the first major pieces of legislation that I had to deal with when I was first elected was the, the last planning uh, bill that came through this parliament, and it was so much fun that I couldn't resist the temptation to come back, even with one small, modest little amendment. Uh, it, it is smaller in scope than some of the much bigger issues that the committee's already been discussing uh, today. But in communities which are threatened with the potential loss of a, of a pub, which is an important social space in their community, uh, it's, a, it's a big issue. Uh, I'd like to draw members' attention to the, the fact that I'm a, a member of CAMERA, the Campaign for Real Ale, and of the cross-party group on beer and pubs, of which CAMERA are the secretariat. And I mention that, of course, because <laughs> CAMERA have been involved in advising on the drafting of this amendment, which is designed to close a loophole uh, one which has already been addressed south of the border, uh, but which uh, could be addressed in Scotland, in which, uh, while the change of use of a pub requires planning permission, uh, in many cases the demolition does not. Uh, and this has been used as a, as a loophole, uh, allowing uh, pubs to be uh, to become used for to be sites that are used for other purposes, such as redevelopment into housing or other purposes. Uh, without that uh, initial opportunity for the community to say 
what it thinks of that proposal uh, and, to, and to seek to make the case uh, that a pub should continue to be a pub. Uh, this is less of an issue in the urban environment, uh, where demolition is m much less likely uh, to be the, the course of action. Those kind of premises, even if a big chain pub is, is moving out, are more likely to be reused either as another pub, uh, another business, or, or a different kind of, of business. But in smaller communities in particular, uh, especially where the pub acts as a, a really important social hub within the community, uh, it can be a problem. What are the, the potential outcomes? Well, in the best case scenario uh, where this is proposed, the community, because of the requirement for planning permission, would have the time in which to, to make its representations about what it thinks should happen, uh, even potentially the time uh, to form the, 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 the social capital to make a bid to take community ownership uh, of that pub. Community-owned pubs are run very responsibly in terms of licensing laws. They tend to be very good employers. They tend to be very innovative about working with different services and, and uh, other businesses within the community uh, to create a, a genuinely social space uh, rather than just looking to extract maximum profits. They actually tend to need to be less profitable in order to be viable because they have the support of the community around them. Now, that would be the best case scenario. It's unlikely to happen in every situation, but we should give the maximum opportunity for that to happen, and a requirement for planning consent would be one extra opportunity for the community to have their say. What's the worst case scenario? The worst case scenario is if a community loses perhaps its only pub uh, uh, without the ability to intervene and say what it thinks about that, and you end up with, with many more people simply drinking at home. And we know that that, that leads to less healthy drinking habits as well uh, as the loss of that, that social space. I hope that the Minister, uh, as the UK Government has already done, is willing to close this loophole. Uh, if the Minister wants to do it in a different way, I'd be very open uh, to, to having the issue approached uh, in a different way than this particular amendment, but I'm grateful to have had the opportunity to flag this one up, uh, and hopefully there'll be some uh, agreement uh, around the intention of what I'm proposing, uh, regardless of the, the views on the, the specific text of the amendment. And Thank I move you. Amendment 316. Thank you very much. Uh, nobody else is wanting to intervene in this. Um, yeah, uh, thank you, convener. Um, and thank you to Patrick Harvey for his interest in, in the planning bill. Um, I'm sympathetic to what the member says about the role of community-owned pubs and uh, in terms of bringing people together because, you know, drinking um, in the home um, is, is something that we know is becoming a, a bigger a bigger problem. Um, I'm not sure that this approach is necessary. Um, I, I am concerned that the, the amendment has been drawn too widely because it's not just pubs, it's also wine bars and other drinking establishments, which could be practically anything that has a, an alcohol licence. Um, so it could bring in you know, other halls and other buildings. So I, I'm not convinced, uh, even though uh, Mr Harvey has been very eloquent, eloquent in, in his um, statement, but I don't think I'd be able to support this today. Uh, Graham. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Uh, I'm, I'm also a member of the cross-party group on the beer and pubs. Um, and I'd I get fully where Patrick Harvey is coming from uh, on this. However, um, I do agree with Monica Lennon. I think the way this is drafted is too wide. Um, it's, not, it's not protecting the kind of establishment that Patrick Harvey wants to protect, which I think is the, the sort of community local. Um, the, the, the amendment uh, uses the phrase, uh, also includes wine bars or other drinking establishments. That's anywhere with a an alcohol licence. Um, so I think that's going uh, too far. Um, I would urge Patrick Harvey maybe to have a rethink um, for stage three, but we'll not be supporting it at this point. Okay, thank you. Um, Minister. I think it would be fair to say that I like a good local pub myself, um, but as with the previous group, um, I do not support the amendment. Um, and I do think that this issue uh, should be brought forward when we review the uh, GPDO uh, with full public consultation. Um, we want to see a, th a thriving pub sector and recognise that a pub uh, can be the focal point within a, a community. Um, pubs provide good employment opportunities, uh, create economic activity and are integral uh, to the tourism sector and to our nighttime economy. 
Um, and I understand the, the con concern uh, that in some places a pub closure uh, may mean the loss of a, a very important amenity. However, that is an issue about business closing, uh, which may be for a variety of reasons. Uh, and preventing the demolition of a pub under permitted development rights will not um, in itself do anything to keep that venue thriving. Uh, the amendment would apply to buildings whose last loss, lawful use was as a pub, even if the business ceased trading some time uh, previously. Um, and in some cases, demolition may be necessary if the building has become derelict, although it's worth mentioning that the per permitted development rights for demolition uh, do not apply when a building has been, been allowed to become uninhabitable or unsafe through neglect or deliberate action if it is pract practicable uh, to make it safe. Uh, the material redevelopment or change of use of a pub's uh, location would still require an application for planning permission. Uh, furthermore, I've referred to pubs throughout everything that I've said here. Um, as there is actually no definition of drinking establishment. Uh, so it's impossible to consider the potential consequences if some others have mentioned of this amendment on any location where drink is taken, uh, such as restaurants and coffee bars and the list goes on, convener. I do consider that this amendment is too sweeping uh, and I don't believe it is the right way to support those pubs uh, that provide a hub for the local community. Um, I would ask the uh, committee um, not to support it. Uh, and as I say, I think this is an issue that we can deal with with full public consultation when we review general per permitted development uh, order rights. Okay. Thank you, Convener. Thank you very much. Uh, Patrick Harvey to wind up and address a withdraw. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, again, not to take too much time, I, I, I'm, I'm grateful that the, the Minister recognises that there is an issue here and that the, there may be other ways of, of addressing it. Uh, I'd be happy to ask the Committee's permission to withdraw the amendment for the time being uh, with the view to either raising this again at Stage 3 uh, or in some other context, uh, and I'd be happy to write to the Minister about uh, how we might uh, move forward with that. Thank you very much. Uh, Patrick Harvey wishes to withdraw his amendment. Does any member present object to this amendment being withdrawn? No. That, the amendment, therefore, is withdrawn. Uh, and that uh, is the end of this public session. Can I thank the Minister, particularly for his use of the words panda love in the planning bill? It's something I never, ever thought I'd heard say. Uh, his officials and all the other MSPs who attended today's meeting. Day six of stage two will take place on the 7th of November. Any remaining amendments to the bill should be lodged by 12 noon on Thursday, 1st of November. And I briefly suspend the meeting to allow the minister, his officials and other members to leave the table.